Chapter 51 Third Year The Man Who Cried Wolf Christmas Day, 1973 Remus's odd late-night conversation with Philomena had caused him to re-evaluate his anxiety about girlfriends. His ability to comfort her had stirred no particular feelings of chivalry or affection, only a mild sense of relief that he'd got her to stop crying. He definitely had no desire to get that close to any other girl. He thought about Narcissa for the first time in a while. Remus had secretly thought Narcissa was the most beautiful girl he knew, before she dyed her hair anyway. She had a regal sharpness which appealed to him on some base level, but even she was made foolish by love risking her own life, in fact. The sight of Philomena sobbing in her nighty only cemented in Remus's mind the revelation that love and relationships were not worth the misery. He had enough pain in his life. Let Sirius and James work it out for themselves, but for the time being, Remus felt very intelligent for having come to this realisation so early in life. he probably saved himself a lot of needless stress. Christmas morning was as wonderful as it had been the year before. Even Philomena perked up once she saw presents under the tree with her name on them. Remus was able to enjoy the immense satisfaction of handing out his own presents, and Sirius and the Potters were all suitably pleased and thanked him profusely. He himself received a chess set from the Potters, which was perhaps the most expensive thing Remus had ever owned, and bought just for him, not second-hand. Along with the usual assortment of sweets and practical jokes from the Marauders, it was a very good haul. Sirius looked a bit nonplussed at breakfast as everyone else wolfed down their smoked salmon and scrambled eggs. So were you? James asked, mouthful. Sirius shrugged. Nothing from Andromeda, he said quietly. I didn't think I'd get presents or anything now she's got the baby, but I thought maybe a card. I sent her one. James swallowed and patted his friend's shoulder. Owl might just be flying late. You know how the post is this time of year. James had received a brand new broom for Christmas, and as soon as breakfast was finished with, all three boys headed straight outside to test it. Sirius had his own broom with him, and Mr. Potter suggested with an arched eyebrow that Remus takes James's old one. Yeah, have it if you want, Mooney, James nodded enthusiastically. To keep! Thanks. Remus took it, unable to say no in front of James's parents. Goodness knew what he was supposed to do with it over the summer. Try explaining that one to Matron. James and Sirius spent the rest of the morning showing off, and Remus spent it hovering, just skimming the ground with his toes, trying to read his book and look like he was enjoying the broom. He hoped Peter had received his gifts from them, and wasn't having too bad of a time with his own family. They were called in by the Potter's house-elf Gully, who was dressed in a festive tea towel and had a sprig of holly tucked behind one ear. It was almost lunchtime, and the house smelled deliciously of roast beef with all the trimmings. "'Upstairs, washed and changed, the lot of you,' Mrs. Potter shook her wooden spoon at them. "'I've had Gully set your things out.' They washed and dressed quickly, stomachs growling as the wonderful smells from the kitchen wafted up the stairs. Just as they began to make their way down, there was the telltale crack of apparition outside the front door. Sirius tensed again, and Remus, one step behind him on the staircase, gripped his shoulder in a way that he hoped was comforting. Sirius turned round and looked Remus in the eye, giving him a gentle smile of appreciation. It was quite unserious like but it felt good. The bell rang and they both turned back to it, James running forward to open the door. A couple stood in the entranceway, a young man and woman holding a bundle in their arms. He had a mop of curly hair and a rather stocky build. She was taller and more slender, as they stepped into the light of the hallway, Remus sucked in his breath. She was the spitting image of Sirius's cousin, Bellatrix. No! Sirius gasped, starting forward, a smile bursting on his face. Sirius! The young woman grinned back and Remus relaxed, seeing that it wasn't actually Bellatrix. This woman had the same wildly curly hair as her sister, though it was a much lighter shade of brown. It had to be Andromeda. She passed the baby in her arms over to the man next to her, presumably her husband, Ted, and stretched out her arms to pull Sirius into a huge hug. Remus watched with fierce jealousy, and not a little guilt. He'd never seen Sirius so embraced by anyone, let alone a member of his family. Remus made his way slowly down the stairs as Mrs. Potter entered the hallway now, smiling widely, looking very pleased with herself. 
A good surprise, then, she asked as Sirius took Ted's hand and tentatively patted the baby's head. You did this? Sirius stared at James's mother in wonder. Effie was kind enough to invite us, Ted smiled, his eyes twinkling. Pleased to meet you, Sirius. Nice to meet someone in Dromeda's family. Come in, come in. Mrs. Potter ushered the gathering into the hall. They all followed her toward the dining room, Remus last of all. Andromeda was the polar opposite of the rest of the Black family, or at least those Remus had met so far, though she was as strikingly beautiful as the rest of them, with the same piercing eyes and biting wit. She was full of laughter and merriment. Ted clearly adored her too, and hardly seemed to mind that she left him with the baby most of the time. Dora was the strangest infant Remus had ever seen, though admittedly he'd not met many. She was as cheerful as her mother, with a gummy grin. Her wisps of hair changed from purple to green to blue with each moment, which everyone seemed to find cute rather than bizarre. Before sitting down to eat, they were joined by several other guests, old family friends of the Potters, including, much to Remus's excitement, old Darius Barebones. A toast! Mr. Potter raised his glass rather tipsily at the end of the meal. To friends, old and new! To the Potters! Andromeda raised her own glass. Protectors of outcasts and defenders of black sheep everywhere! Everyone laughed and clinked glasses. I think I must be the most outcast, Sirius said happily. I'm a Gryffindor after all. To Gryffindor, Mr. Potter called out from the other end of the table. Only the Gryffindors toasted, Andromeda narrowed her eyes at Sirius. Think so, little cousin? Try marrying a non-relative. I'll have to, Sirius responded as Gully cleared away the plates and Mrs. Potter fetched in the Christmas pudding. After Sissy's wedding, there aren't any black women left. There's Dora. Excuse me, Ted said, protectively covering his daughter's ears. Could we please get her through her first Christmas before arranging a betrothal? I'm teasing. Andromeda leaned over to kiss them both. Dora can marry whomever she likes when she's old enough, and I can say with absolute certainty that it won't be anyone at this table. Everyone laughed again. Remus eyed Darius furtively. He was looking just as merry as Mr. Potter, his face glowing red from the fire whiskey he'd been knocking back. Once the pudding was extinguished, served and eaten, crackers pulled and terrible jokes read out, the party adjourned to the living room. Mrs. Potter, Philomena and Andromeda went upstairs to change into their party dresses. Mr. Potter smoked his pipe and Ted settled Dora down for a nap. The boys settled into a game of snap before Darius and Mr. Potter wrangled everyone into a round of charades. Remus had never played charades before, let alone magical charades, which involved a lot of red and gold sparks, though that may have just been high spirits. In the evening, more guests began to arrive and the house was soon full of music, laughter and pleasant chatter. Andromeda and Sirius appointed themselves DJs, rifling through their combined record collections and alternating, blasting, slades, Merry Christmas, everyone, and I Wish It Could Be Christmas Every Day by Wizard. When the snowman brings the snow, well, he might just like to know, he put a big smile on somebody's face. They're actually called Wizard, though, Sirius kept telling everyone earnestly, and just listen to it. Even Philomena forgot her melancholy for a few hours, getting up and moving to the music along with James, who was at just about the same height as her and had no clue how to dance, but was pretty chuffed when she took his hand and showed him how to twist. Quite sure he would not be missed, Remus slipped between the throngs of people in search of Darius. There must have been a hundred witches and wizards in abundance, some of them teachers at Hogwarts, who Remus did everything to avoid. He heard at least three people murmur that Dumbledore was there, somewhere. They're both blacks, you know, he heard one witch whispering to her friend as they watched Andromeda and Sirius giggling hysterically by the record player. She's run off and had a baby with that Tonks chap and the boy. Well, he was the heir, but I heard Orion is planning to contest it as soon as the younger boy is of age. Quite the little hellraiser from what I've heard. He can't be any worse than Orion was. I went to school with him. Nasty, vicious kid. Sirius is a ray of sunshine compared to Orion, and don't get me started on that bitch Walperga. 
Shh, the first witch said nervously. You never know who's listening these days, even at the Potters. Well, what's he doing here at all? I'd like to know. He chums with the Potter boy. You know what Emphy and Monty are like. They've taken in the Pettigrew's eldest, too. She's over there. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. Well, it's no secret why she's here. The Pettigrews and the Potters are both pure blood after all, despite the rumours. Mind you, Effie might want to act too quickly. If Philomena sees her chance to bag the black heir, then poor James isn't going to get a look in, is he? I mean, everyone knows what's going on. We all need to pick a side. The Potters picked theirs a long time ago, I'm afraid. Remus felt his blood boil. It was horrible hearing his friends spoken about like that, and the Potters who Remus was absolutely certain had no ulterior motives when it came to their son, or the company they kept. They let James be friends with him, after all, knowing exactly what he was. He clenched his fists, wishing he was allowed to do magic, do anything to shut these mean old bitches up. Sirius and Andromeda were now bawling at the top of their lungs, joined by James and Philomena. "'Well, I wish it was Christmas every day, yay. When the kids start singing and the band begins to play, yay. Ooh, I wish it would be Christmas every day. So the bells ring out for Christmas! Remus smiled and at the same moment finally caught sight of Darius. The old man was steaming drunk now, leaning heavily on the banister in the hallway and talking to an old woman who looked like she would very much like to get away from him. Remus straightened his back and consciously smoothed his features. He'd borrowed a set of James's smart dress robes for the occasion, and Philomena had kindly performed a cosmetic spell on his scars. As such, he hoped that he'd get away with at least appearing to be the son of a famous wizard, rather than a muggle brat from a children's home. "'Good evening, Mr. Barebones,' he said, affecting an accent he'd learned from three years of listening to James and Sirius's received pronunciation. He held out a hand to the old man, who shook it, looking at him puzzled. Remus Lupin, you remember we met last year? Oh, yes, the Lupin boy. That's right, Remus nodded, smiling serenely, keeping his expression controlled. He handed Darius another whiskey, as the witch the old man had previously been talking to snuck away. I believe you knew my father. Like Lupin, best jeweler I ever knew. Married a muggle somewhere in Wales, didn't he? That's right, Remus said steadily. My mother. He took a careful breath as Darius guzzled more whiskey, then cleared his throat. Did you know Lyle very well? He found that Lyle was much easier to say than my father. Oh, quite well, quite well, Darius nodded enthusiastically, thrilled to have someone to talk to. Worked under him at the ministry before all the trouble started. Never knew anyone better with bogots or dementors come to that. The Azkaban liaison office has missed him, I can tell you. The trouble? Remus asked, swiping another glass of whiskey from Gully, who hurried past with a tray and handed it to the old man. Thank you, dear boy. Yes, the trouble. Nasty business. Nasty. You're talking about the events that led to Lyle's suicide. He couldn't say it. Darius had to say it. I'm talking about the damn werewolves. Darius slammed his empty whiskey glass down on a nearby sideboard. Forgive me, he muttered. Not at all. Remus replied, unblinking. Do go on. I know the story, of course, but I'd like to hear it from someone who knew him. Darius surveyed him carefully through his whisky adled haze. He seemed to slump slightly before beginning his story. We couldn't possibly know, you understand. None of us. Well, Lyle was a great wizard, a great wizard, you hear me? He slurred. Remus nodded. But! The old man looked upwards, glassy-eyed. Well, he did have a tendency to obsess over things. And that temper, 
flew into rages at work, even during committee meetings, even. Committee meetings? Remus almost broke character. Hasn't your mother told you? Darius looked at him, surprised. Bloody muggles. Not fit to raise our children, I've said it for years. He sighed. Your father was on several committees at the Ministry for the regulation and control of magical creatures. Remus was glad he'd taken care of magical creatures, otherwise he'd know nothing about this. As it was, he was able to nod knowingly. Darius continued. Just his area, of course, he was a giant in the field. But he liked his own way, and he was seen as a bit of an extremist in those days. Wanted an overhaul of the werewolf registry, better identification and tracking measures. We just didn't have the manpower for it, and resources were better spent elsewhere. And Lupin... He'd been working with dark creatures for so many years, he thought he saw werewolves everywhere. Always saw danger when there clearly wasn't any. Honestly, we all thought he was a bit eccentric. We couldn't have known. Well, when they brought Grey back in, I was there. I saw him. In mind, I don't mind telling you, none of us thought he was a threat. Clearly drunk. Confused. A vagrant. That's what we thought. And when Lupin went off on one of his rants about werewolves, well, we didn't think twice. You let Grey back go, Remus said stonily. Darius looked very sorry for himself now, almost weepy. He nodded. We let him go. Of course now, now we know. If only we'd listened. Lyle killed himself just after that. Didn't want to hear the committee's apology. He sighed and looked at Remus again. I've always wondered what drove him to it, you know. Some say it was the guilt, not being able to sort their grey back. I wouldn't have thought he was the type. to and abandon his family like that, I mean. You couldn't have been much more than a baby. Five, Remus said. I was five. Yes, well... Darius shifted uncomfortably, looking morosely down at his empty glass. I have my own little theory about that, about what happened. What if Greyback came after him, eh? We know how dangerous he is now. We know he hates wizards more than anything else, and your father says some very unpleasant things. So what I wonder is, did Greyback go back and get him? Did he bite him? If that's what happened, then I must say... I don't blame Lyle at all. Only good beasts are dead beasts. Hmm, Remus replied, feeling very hot and a bit dizzy. And Greyback? Last I heard, he's in the with you know who. Darius shook his head. And the damned irony of it all is that we need your father more than ever. Still, he smiled at Remus kindly. Don't think he died in vain, dear boy. We did end up implementing a lot of his reforms, particularly where half-breeds are concerned. Can't escape the registry now! No, sir! He slammed his wizened old fist down. Excuse me, Remus turned quickly. He'd heard enough. I hear Mr. Potter calling. He slipped back into the crowd of merrymakers, the music still blaring as Sirius and Andromeda led everyone in chorus. So here it is. Merry Christmas. Everyone's having fun. Look up to the future now. It's only just begun. Chapter 52. Third Year. Confidence. Saturday, 5th of January, 1974. 
Sheets of rain battered against the Hogwarts Express like a volley of enemy arrows, covering the usually green hillsides in a gauzy veil of mist and drizzle, darkening the sky. Feels rubbish going back to school, doesn't it? Sirius said sulkily, glaring out the window. Remus glanced over at Peter, who was staring at Sirius in disbelief. Sirius didn't notice. Remus sighed. How was your Christmas, Pete? he asked politely. Okay, Peter replied dully. Thanks for the sweets. Seen my broom? James asked, pulling it down from the luggage rack. Peter got up to look, perking up a bit. Remus rolled his eyes and returned to his book. He wasn't really reading it. He hadn't been able to concentrate properly on a book since the Potter's Christmas party. In fact, he hadn't been able to concentrate on anything at all. Not flying, or games, or conversations, or James and Sirius's Animagus planning. So he pretended to read, hoping they'd leave him to it. At St. Edmund's, he'd have just skulked off by himself into town, but that didn't seem like a very good way to show gratitude to James's parents, who were sure to worry. It was as if there were a list of questions in his head that he had no way of getting answers to, so they just played back on repeat, round and round. Where was Grey back now? Who was you-know-who? Had Lyle Lupin hated his son that much? Remus had already known his father had killed himself because he'd been bitten. He'd always assumed that Lyle Lupin had been motivated by guilt, but now... Well, what if Remus had been wrong? What if the real reason had been hatred, or even worse? Shame. For the past three years, Remus had been working hard at school, using his father's wand and taking the subjects his father might have taken. He didn't think about Lyle all the time, but in the back of his mind it still meant something. Since the Christmas party, he wasn't so sure any more. Ferox had said, Know thyself, but Remus was failing to see the wisdom in that now. He'd been much happier not knowing. These dark thoughts were interrupted by a quiet tapping at the carriage door. Marlene poked her head round. Hi, McKinnon, James grinned. Evan's with you. Uh, no, she squeaked, fiddling with her hair nervously. Sirius, can I talk to you? Me? Sirius sat up, looking confused. Uh, what is it? Mary, um, Mary asked me to tell you something. Tell me what? She's... I don't think I was supposed to say it in front of this lot. Uh, okay. Sirius got up and followed her outside into the corridor. The other three exchanged amused looks while they waited. Ugh, Remus thought. Had he been mistaken about the Mary and Sirius thing? Was it Sirius and Marlene now? Moments later, a stunned-looking Sirius re-entered the compartment alone. Well, James asked. Mary's got a boyfriend, apparently, Sirius said, confused. You mean, you got dumped? I don't know. He sat down, scratching his head. Was I going out with her? Well, apparently she thought you were. Why don't girls just say what they mean? Sirius ran his hand through his hair in a good imitation of James, who nodded in a sympathetic way. Girls are a nightmare, he agreed. Remus celebrated inwardly. Thank goodness all of this was behind them. Sunday, 6th of January, 1974. He later learned that Mary had started to go out with a muggle boy she knew from home. We grew up on the same block, she confided in him excitedly. His flat's just across from mine. I properly fancied Sirius, and he's nice and everything, but, well, he's a bit posh. I don't think he knows what a council flat is. Remus had to agree to that one. As for himself, he warmed to Mary once again, and didn't ever even mind her going on and on about her new boyfriend, and how he'd taken her to the local dance hall, and the pictures, and how her mum loved him, and her dad thought he was a good boy. Marlene, however, looked terminally bored as they sat around by the fire doing their last bits of holiday homework together. This did not escape Mary's notice. Don't be jealous, Miles. I'm not, Marlene frowned. I just think you're being horrible to Sirius. What? Dumping him like that. You hurt his feelings. Marlene's cheeks had turned an uncharacteristic shade of pink. No, she didn't, Remus snorted. Both girls glared at him as if he'd completely misunderstood. Oh my God, 
Mary stared at her friend. Marlene, do you fancy Sirius? No! Marlene stood up, bright red now. Oh, you're such a bitch, Mary! She stormed up to the girls' dorm. Lily sighed, glancing up. That wasn't very nice, she said reproachfully. Her problem, not mine, Mary shrugged. Does she fancy Sirius? Does it matter? I'm going too. Remus stood up, trying not to heave a sigh. Oh, don't go, Remus, Mary said. We'll stop talking about boys, I promise. I'm tired, he lied, and I've finished mine. See you tomorrow. As he walked away, he heard Mary whisper very loudly. Oh, my God, maybe he fancies Miles. Remus reminded himself that he was trying to like Mary again and didn't react. He climbed the stairs and went to sit in the dorm room alone. James, Peter and Sirius were all in detention for a prank they'd pulled before Christmas. He wasn't tired at all. It was two nights before the full moon and he was beginning to feel the usual telltale restlessness in his limbs, the familiar quickening of his heartbeat. Left to his own devices, Remus returned to the troubling thoughts that had been bothering him for weeks. Again, they seemed to just swirl through his brain in a big soupy mess without beginning or end. Did all wizards feel the same as Darius, as Lyle Lupin? Were his father's actions really justifiable? Remus couldn't ignore the fact that his mother had also abandoned him, which had to mean something. His friends certainly hadn't treated him any different after finding out, but then how could anyone truly know what their friends thought of them? The marauders liked anything dangerous. Perhaps sharing a room with Remus was simply another exciting risk. What he really needed was to speak to somebody impartial. James was so lucky having two parents always willing to listen. Sirius was lucky to have James. Remus wasn't sure if Peter had problems or not. Probably did. Probably told James too. There was McGonagall. Remus knew that they were supposed to go to her with their problems. But she was so stern and difficult, and she liked James best anyway. Madame Pomfrey, of course. She'd been supportive before. But she wasn't one to let you feel sorry for yourself. She'd just try to come up with a common-sense solution, or else tell him not to worry so much. Then Dumbledore. But Remus had no idea to talk to him, and he wasn't even sure he wanted to. As far as people who knew the complexities of Remus's problem, there was also Professor Ferox. Remus was 95% sure he knew anyway. He pondered this as a solution. Remus felt a sort of undefinable kinship with his care of magical creatures, Professor. He had a very reassuring presence, and Remus thought he might feel better if he could speak to him, somehow sure that Ferox would lend a sympathetic ear. There was a funny flutter in his stomach, like excitement, and Remus thought that was a good sign. He glanced at the clock in the corner. It was only five o'clock. The other boys wouldn't be out of detention until six, and curfew wasn't until eight. Remus pulled out the marauder's map from under his pillow. The basic outline of the castle was complete now. They just needed to finalise the grounds, animate the staircases, and add the secret places only they knew about. Then Sirius's tagging idea could come next, though they still weren't sure how to go about it. Remus had discovered one spell which would locate a single person, but nothing of the magnitude they required. Still, he cast his locator spell now and found that Professor Ferox was walking from the Great Hall to the staff room. Remus got up quickly. If he was fast, then he could make it look like a chance encounter. He grabbed James's cloak before leaving, just in case Mary and Lily were still in the common room. He was just reaching the doorknob when he had a sudden flash of sense. What on earth was he doing? Going to see Professor Ferox? And then what? Whinge to him about his dead father? Cry to him about how no one ever understood him because he was a murderous dark creature with a working-class accent. Moan about how his friends were all going girl-mad and he felt left behind. Remus retreated back into the room. What on earth would Ferox think of him? That he was a big wuss, that's what. You can go crying to teachers whenever something bothered you. You couldn't just expect everyone to feel sorry for you. No one owes you a happy life, Matron always said. He lay on his bed and stared up at the canopy. He felt worse now. He didn't know what had come over him. He was never normally one to act on impulse. Not any more. Not since first year. He just felt so strongly that he ought to see his teacher. Ah! There it was again. 
that flutter in his midsection. It wasn't excitement at all, it was... Well, he wasn't sure what it was. He felt hot and flushed and oddly prickly. It was something... animal. Oh, God. Remus let out a groan. It must be the transformation. The wolf was creeping in earlier than usual, maybe. It probably liked the smell of Ferox, or it caught the scent of his nasal. Did wolves eat cats? Only good beasts are dead beast. That's what Darius told him. At the time, Remus felt it was a little unfair. After all, he'd never hurt anyone. Dumbledore wouldn't let that happen. He definitely didn't want to hurt anyone, either. Except occasionally Snape. And that was just normal, wasn't it? Perhaps Remus was more dangerous than he thought he was. He'd learnt to control his temper most of the time now that he'd learned to control his magic. He just had to learn to control whatever this was, too. When James, Sirius, and Peter returned, Remus made up his mind. I've had a think, he started. No wonder you needed a lie down, Sirius smirked. Remus threw a pillow at him. Piss off, I'm serious. No, I'm serious. James slapped him round the head. Shut up, Black. Thanks, Remus smiled. Uh, the whole Animagus thing. Yeah? Sirius looked more eager now, still rubbing his head. Had an idea. I love Mooney ideas. Uh, not exactly. Remus felt awkward now. Still, it had to be done. He'd made a decision. I... I don't want you to do it. Do what? Peter looked confused. He doesn't want us to become Animagi, James said, looking at Remus with those clear, honest eyes. Is that right? Remus nodded, feeling horribly guilty. I'm really grateful, I am. I just... I don't think any of you really understand how dangerous it could be. I could hurt you. I could... I could kill you. I've got no control over it. But it's going to work, Sirius protested. I did all the research, James. Did you show him? Leave it, mate, James said. It's Lupin's decision. Thanks. Remus smiled at James. He felt terrible for letting them down, but it was for their own good, and he had to be the mature one. Sirius looked like he wanted to say something else, but James gave him a hard look that was so like Mrs. Potter that it silenced the shorter boy at once. They didn't say much else for the rest of the evening, and Remus had to pretend to read his book again. Later that night, after lights out, Remus heard Sirius creep over to James's bed and cast the silencing spell for the first time in a long time. He wished they would invite him, just once. He wished he wasn't always the one laughed out. He wished he knew how it felt to have a friend as close as James. More than ever, he wanted someone to talk to. Suddenly overwhelmed, Remus quickly cast his own spell so the others wouldn't hear him crying. Chapter 53 Third Year Davy Gudgeon A note Trigger warning for homophobic slur and a bit of swearing. Winter passed into spring, and as per usual, Remus's birthday was celebrated with creative vigour by the other marauders, the customary singing at every mealtime, the cake, presents. Unfortunately, McGonagall was wise to their antics this year, and had a prefect watching the boys' dorms to prevent any further midnight fireworks displays. Fortunately, Remus's 14th fell on a Hogsmeade weekend, and he felt very grown up indeed spending the afternoon in the three broomsticks with his friends. It soon became clear that James and Sirius had somehow bribed all their classmates to stop by the pub too, as a steady stream of students approached their table wanting to buy Remus a butterbeer or toast his health. By the time the afternoon was over, everyone in the bar knew Remus's name, and he was raucously cheered on his way out. Completely embarrassing, of course. With his birthday out of the way, Remus threw himself into revision in preparation for the upcoming exams. He had a particular urge to do well in his new subjects, not least care of magical creatures. By returning his focus to study and schoolwork, Remus slowly began to put the cruel words of Darius Barebones behind him. Yes, he was dangerous, and yes, once everyone found out what Remus was, he would most likely be shunned. But until then, he had an opportunity to learn. 
and he wasn't going to waste it. Sunday, 7th of April, 1974. Remus had never met Davy Gudgeon before, as far as he knew, nor had the others. He never found out what the kid looked like, even. But he would remember that name until the day he died. Oh. The Whomping okay. Willow had turned into a game during the summer of 1973 by a group of bored first years, and though it was abhorred by Filch and frowned upon by the heads of houses, no one really said anything about it. Try to see how close you can get to the trunk before the branches took a swipe at you. Remus certainly had no inclination to play. He hated that tree. As it was, Remus wasn't even there when it happened. It was the day after a full moon and he was in the hospital wing as usual. Peter was sitting on the floor, sorting through his chocolate frog cards, muttering to himself happily. James was marking Sirius's divination homework, and Sirius was covertly flicking his wand at James behind his back, turning his hair different colours for Remus's amusement. Blue, pink, green, yellow. It was working, too. Remus found it hysterically funny because James looked so serious, and when he was concentrating, his tongue poked out between his teeth like a cat. It was a perfectly pleasant afternoon, and Remus could almost ignore how much his bones and teeth hurt as they settled back into place for another cycle. But then it happened. The hospital door slammed open and a student came in, shrieking, Madam Pomfrey! Madam Pomfrey, help! Nosy as they were, James and Sirius jumped down from the bed to peer around the pale green curtains. Remus sighed, leaning back on his pillow. He was accustomed now to the ebb and flow of the hospital wing, Raised voices like that usually meant a spell gone wrong. He tried to ignore it. He resented anything that reminded him he was in a hospital, and not just enjoying a lazy afternoon with his friends. But James and Sirius remained out of view, watching whatever the scene was unfold, and when they turned back toward the bed, their faces were pale and serious. The commotion had grown louder. Remus was dimly aware that someone was crying. "'What is it?' he asked more irritably than he meant to. Sirius's mouth twisted and James shook his head mutely, pushing his glasses up his nose. Peter finally looked up from his cards. What? An accident. Some kid, James murmured. Everyone out! Madame Pomfrey's voice echoed through the chamber, unnaturally loud and clear. The curtain round Remus's bed parted and she poked her head through, looking distracted. Remus, dear, if you're feeling well enough, it might be best for you to spend the rest of the afternoon in your own bed. Potter, would you go and fetch Professor Sprout? Tell her one of the students has been injured. James nodded and left immediately, without even glancing back at his friends or his homework. You could always rely on James. Sirius caught Remus's eye and Remus nodded his assent, climbing out of bed. He was still in his pyjamas and Sirius hoiked peeked her up by the elbow to give him some privacy. Remus dressed as quickly as he could, shoved his books into his bag, grabbed James's work, and joined his friends on the other side of the curtain. He could smell blood. Curtains had been drawn round the bed nearest the door, and the three boys hurried past it, wanting nothing more than to escape the unpleasant atmosphere and get as far away as possible. They went straight to the common room, Remus limping slightly, Sirius and Peter slowing down to match his pace. What was it? Remus whispered. There was blood. Yeah, Sirius replied, looking shaken. I don't know what happened, but it was his face. Peter looked faintly ill. They reached the common room and Remus collapsed into an armchair, exhausted. You okay? Sirius asked anxiously, touching a hand to Remus's shoulder. Remus nodded, closing his eyes and breathing deeply. Fine, fine. He shrugged Sirius off, embarrassed, wishing he could be normal for once. All right, lads, Mary sauntered into the room, Marlene in tow. Hear what happened to the gudgeon kid? No, Sirius replied slyly. What? Whacked in the face by that mental tree, she said, shaking her cloak off. They were trying to touch the trunk. The whomping willow? Yeah, Marlene piped up. It shouldn't be allowed, it's so dangerous. Did you see it happen? Remus asked, trying to keep the panic out of his voice. Nope, Mary shrugged, flinging herself down on the couch next to Sirius. Heard it from one of the second year girls. They've got to get rid of it, Marlene said shrilly. Dumbledore can't leave it there now. Someone could get killed. He should have stayed away from it, 
Sirius said, frowning. It's a stupid game. Everyone knows what that tree's like. Have I gone mad? Mary laughed. Sirius Black, the voice of reason? Piss off, MacDonald, Sirius scowled. Remus was starting to get a headache. He rubbed his temple and closed his eyes again, shrinking down into the armchair. Guilt creeped up his spine, hot and cold pinpricks. It hit him in the face. Would this gudgeon boy be all right? Surely Madame Pomfrey would be able to fix it, whatever it was. She could fix anything. Gossip about Davy Gudgeon flooded into the school in a matter of hours until no one could escape it. Sarah Saunders from Ravenclaw told everyone she'd seen his parents arrive, then marched straight up to Dumbledore's office looking furious. Gudgeon's friends in Hufflepuff relayed the story over and over for anyone who'd listen, that it seemed as though Davy could actually reach the trunk this time, but then the willow lashed out at the very last minute. They heard varying accounts of the damage, that the tree had cracked his skull in two, that he'd lost both his eyes, or even that he'd actually died and the school was covering it up. Marlene, who seemed more distressed than anyone else about the whole thing, enlisted Lily and Mary's help in drawing up a petition to have the Whomping Willow removed from the school grounds. Remus signed it. He couldn't think of a good enough reason not to. Sirius refused. That tree has just as much right to be here as anybody, he said firmly as Marlene chased him with a quill. But Sirius, she pleaded, it's dangerous. So are bludgers, he returned, dodging her. You're going to leave the Quidditch team? It's hardly the same thing. Just sign it, Black. Lily groaned, trying to finish her room's homework. What's it to you? It's the principal. He crossed his arms firmly. Lily rolled her huge green eyes. Tosser, she muttered under her breath. Can't he see how upset Mars is? Why is she so upset? Remus asked in a whisper when Marlene was out of earshot. Does she know, Davy? Don't think so, Lily sighed. I just think she wants a project to take her mind off stuff at home. Family, you know. Remus thought about this. He didn't know Marlene as he'd gotten to know Lily and Mary. Mary was so outgoing and could chat to anyone. In fact, if anything, she was a bit of an oversharer. Remus knew far too much about her snogging preferences for his liking. Marlene had always been the quieter, shyer one, less sure of herself, even in the areas she excelled. He didn't know very much about her family simply because it never occurred to him to ask about people's families. He didn't think the petition would really go anywhere. Dumbledore had given a speech prohibiting anyone from going near the Whomping Willow again, and that was all that had been said on the matter. The staff were clearly uneasy, and Remus had just been trying to keep his head down. The other marauders hadn't said anything to him about it and changed the subject whenever it came up. Usually Remus preferred not to discuss anything related to his very little problem, but now he was beginning to wonder whether they secretly blamed him after all. James would never say it out loud, of course. Peter might. Sirius might say so and then instantly take it back. Either way, none of them said a word, leaving Remus's imagination to run wild. A week after the incident, Professor Sprout confirmed the rumour. Davy Gudgeon was now blind and would not be returning to Hogwarts for some time. Remus had been trying to avoid Sprout since it happened. As a biology teacher, he was sure she knew exactly what the Whomping Willow was doing on the grounds in the first place. His parents are taking him to America, where there are advances being made in ocular healing potions, the dumpy professor explained at breakfast. I'm sure Davy and his family are very grateful for all your well wishes. Remus felt a horrible sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. When Marlene, Lily, Mary and a few other students got up to present their petition, which had over 400 signatures now, Remus went with them. Professor Sprout accepted the petition and promised to discuss the matter with Dumbledore. She even awarded Marlene ten points for her efforts. They're not going to get rid of it, though. Sirius said later that evening when the marauders were all alone in their room. No, I doubt it. Remus kicked a stray sock under his bed, hands in his pockets. So why did you go up? Remus shrugged. Felt like the right thing to do. I mean, Marlene's right. The tree's dangerous. Shouldn't be at a school. But... Peter started. I know, Remus snapped. I know, okay? 
You shouldn't feel guilty, mate, James said kindly. Gudgeon shouldn't have been mocking about like that. It's not your fault. If it's anyone's fault, Remus said darkly, then it's mine. That's stupid, Sirius said bluntly, shaking his head. You didn't plant it, did you? I don't know if it's escaped everyone else's attention, but this school is not exactly safety conscious. It's built next to a bloody forest full of creatures more dangerous than a flipping tree. There's supposed to be a literal monster lying dormant somewhere directly below us, and not being funny, but have you seen Hagrid? What's your point, Black? Remus sighed heavily, sitting down. His hip hurt if he stood up for too long. He was getting to be like an old woman. I don't know, Sirius shrugged. Shit happens. Don't blame yourself. Stop moping. Moping? Remus growled, his temperature rising. Fuck off! There's a kid who can't see because I'm too dangerous to be at school. Try telling Marlene what I am. I bet she get a lot more signatures on that petition. You're not dangerous! You don't know what I am, Remus hissed. You're our friend, James said suddenly. Remus stared at him. It was a stupid, soppy, dramatic thing to say. But that was half the problem with James. He so embodied those unrealistic values of loyalty, justice, and honour that he forced you to believe in them too. He sat next to Remus on the bed. You're our friend, and that's the most important thing, okay? He met Remus's glare and glared back, smiling. Okay, he said. Remus continued to glare, and James inched closer so that their knees knocked together. Okay, he said, leaning forward now, his nose centimetres from Remus's. Remus knew this tactic. James did the same thing sometimes to cheer Sirius up. He never blinked. It was highly unnerving, and finally Remus laughed, ducking away. Okay, okay. James laughed too and threw his arms round Remus. Thank goodness! We couldn't lose you, Mooney! he cried. Suddenly Sirius and Peter followed suit, piling on to Remus, who found himself at the bottom of a very giggly scrum. Laughing, despite himself, Remus tried to squirm out from under them. Get off me, you bunch of poofs! Ah, you love us, really. Sirius patted his head. Chapter 54, Third Year, Marlene So, Summer, James asked over butterbeers and the three broomsticks on their last Hogsmeade weekend before exams. Sirius and Remus groaned in unison. You know I can't, Remus started. They'll never let me, Sirius finished. I don't see why, though, James replied innocently. You both came for Christmas. Yeah, but there's some rule about me staying at St. Edmund's for the whole summer. Remus shrugged. While I'm there, I have to follow Muggle law. You don't get to visit anyone when you're in care unless they're related. And you know what my lot are like, Sirius sighed heavily, even after Christmas. And I think that was just to keep me out of the way, to be honest. Reg already told me I'm expected. When did you speak to Regulus? James looked up, surprised. Sirius shifted slightly on his stool, looking awkward. Uh, the other day. Wasn't worth mentioning, only saw him for a minute. I'll be there all summer, James, Peter said loudly. Sirius rolled his eyes rather obviously, but James smiled and patted Peter's knee. Yeah, great, mate. At least I'll have you, eh? I'll be able to swing a Diagon Alley trip, Sirius said, perking up slightly. I've thought about it, and if you brought the invisibility cloak, then we might be able to work something out. The three of them began to chat excitedly about this plan. Remus let them. Ever since he'd put a stop to the Animagus initiative, the Marauders had been a bit of a, a loose end. They needed something to use their creative energy on, and it generally had to be at least mildly illegal. Mooney, James said suddenly. Where is St. Edmund's exactly? Epping Forest, Remus supplied promptly. Why? We could always come and visit you. No, Remus said with such forcefulness that Sirius and Peter's head snapped up alarmed. Remus swallowed dryly. Just don't, okay? It's a bad idea. His insides churned. The humiliation he would feel when his friends saw how he lived, where he came from, it would be too much to bear. 
What would they say when they saw his dull grey muggle clothes, at the other boys' rough faces and hard knuckles, the concrete blocks and the splintering portico bins and the scrubby patch of grass out front? They would pity him. All right, he said hurriedly, hoping to allay them, and you lot can tell me everything you get up to. Hopefully I can come to Christmas again, Potter. You might not, Sirius said suddenly. Full moon's on the 29th this December. Remus looked at him oddly. He prided himself in having an excellent memory, but Sirius took the cake when it came to the moon cycles. James laughed. How come you've memorised every bloody moon until we're fifty, but you can't get above an acceptable in astronomy? Some things are important to remember, some things aren't, Sirius shrugged, draining his tankard. And messing up the constellations really annoys my parents. Mid-May, 1974. Remus yawned and closed his book. He'd done plenty. More than enough. Too much, if you were to ask Sirius. But then it was all very well if you were lucky enough to have wealthy dead relatives. Someone with Remus's prospects couldn't afford to slack off. The library was open for extended hours during the exam period, but even so, it was almost closing time, with only a few much older students left behind, blinking sleepily at their texts. Lily, Mary and Marlene had gone to bed at least an hour ago, or saw Remus thought, anyway. The days had become very repetitive in the lead up to the end of term, and time no longer truly felt linear. He hadn't even been outside in days. Wearily, he stood up, rubbing his eyes, and carried a pile of books back toward the study of magical creatures' shelves. He found that he could stay on Pince's good side if he tidied up after himself, and it wasn't much effort. He liked being in the library late. It was nice and quiet. Growing up in a boy's home and sharing a bedroom with the marauders had given Remus precious few moments for peace and quiet. As he turned round the final row of stacks, he caught sight of a small figure slumped at the end, fast asleep over a single desk. Tiptoeing forward, he recognised the fan of blonde hair splayed over the pages of an open book. Marlene, he whispered as he got closer. Marlene, he tapped her shoulder gently. She jumped violently, fast enough to give Remus whiplash, then stared out with confused, bleary eyes. Remus? You fell asleep, he explained, keeping his voice low. Library's closing soon. Oh, no! She looked distraught, gazing down at her parchment, which was blank. She'd smeared a bit of ink at the top, but nothing more. Oh, no she said again, forlorn. It's okay, Remus tried to cheer her up. You obviously needed a rest, eh? Still some time before exams start. I've got so much revision to do. I can't remember anything about crops, can you? Come on, Remus dodged the question. We'd better go, a pin's will be after us. Marlene nodded dazedly and got up, letting him lead her out through the maze of bookshelves. As they left, she began muttering to herself. Crops have forked tails, are wary of muggles, and somewhat resemble cocker spaniels. Jack Russells, Remus corrected without thinking. What? Really? Are you sure? The girl grabbed his arm, unreasonably panicked by this information. Uh, yeah, Remus said, reeling back, unable to get away from Marlene's vice-like grip. Of course you're sure, she said woefully, finally letting him go. You're the best in the class. You're very good, too, Remus began, but stopped. Marlene's face crumpled and she burst into tears. I can't do it! I'm going to fail everything! She wailed loudly. A group of Slytherins passing by snickered at her before Remus pointed his wand menacingly at them. Marlene, still weeping, threw herself at Remus, arms round his neck as she sobbed into his shoulder. Taken aback, Remus tried to pat her gently as her tiny body shook against him. He'd never been hugged by a girl before, except James's mum, and that was hardly the same thing. He didn't like it. His shoulder was getting wet. Marlene was completely oblivious to this awkwardness, however. I'm so rubbish, she sniffed. I mess up everything. I'm never going to be as good as Danny, or mum, or you, or Lily. Uh, you're better than Mary at... But Mary's got a boyfriend and everyone fancies her and no one likes me. She cried even harder. At this point, Remus decided that he was definitely in over his head. He patted her awkwardly once more and said, I'll, um, go and get Lily, shall I? No, no, it's okay. Marlene pulled away, still sniffling. 
Her usually pale face was now red and blotchy, her grey eyes still glistening. I'll just go and wash my face, she gestured toward the nearest girl's loos. Will you wait for me? Er, uh, okay. She disappeared and Remus slumped heavily against the wall. He now found himself carrying both of their book bags and his shoulders ached with the weight. What might the others do in this situation? James would have been chivalrous, obviously. He probably would have known exactly what to say to stop her from crying. Peter would never get himself in the situation in the first place. Sirius? Well, Remus thought Sirius was probably as bad as he was, actually. He wasn't good with emotions. He could barely manage his own. Still, Remus knew that the right thing to do was wait and walk her back to the common room, so he did. It wasn't that Remus didn't feel sympathetic towards Marlene. The pressure on everyone felt enormous. You could hardly ignore it. It was more Remus's general distaste for whinging, and of course he'd never liked being around people who cried. It made him nervous. Marlene looked much better when she came out of the bathroom. A bit flushed, but at least she was calm. Sorry, she smiled at him shyly. I feel silly. It's okay, Remus shrugged. He wondered if he could give her her book bag now. His arms really hurt and his dodgy knee was playing up, never mind his hip. No, probably not. Not a very James thing to do, make a girl carry her own stuff. She didn't offer to take it back, either. Luckily, they weren't too far from Gryffindor Tower. I am feeling silly, she said as they walked. I know I am. My stepdad hates it when I get wound up, says it winds him up. Then Mum gets the worst of it. Danny says I need to toughen up and stop acting like a baby, but... Who's Danny? Remus asked, a bit lost. My brother, she sounded surprised. I'm sure I've mentioned him. He's a beater for the Chudley Cannons. Oh, right, yeah, I did know that, Remus nodded. Must be why you're so good. I'm not as good as Danny. Well... Remus tried to shrug under the weight of the books. You're only fourteen. Bet your brother wasn't as good at fourteen. You beat Sirius and he's really good. Do you really think so? Yeah, Remus replied casually. Obviously. Gryffindor won the cup again this year, didn't they? Because of James. Yeah, well, James is mental. You don't want to be like James. You won't tell Mary what I said, will you? Nope. He had already forgotten what she'd said about Mary, to be honest. She's my best friend, Marlene sniffed. And I'm not jealous of her or anything. She just... Well, she likes to show off, you know. She's so funny and chatty and everything. Sometimes I feel a bit... I mean, she's already been out with Sirius, and now she's got that muggle boyfriend. And I think Professor Ferox likes her more than me. He's a teacher, Remus said. He likes everyone the same. Anyway, you're funny. James is always going on about how you get everyone laughing at Quidditch practice. Really? She seemed to flush again at this news. What about, um, what about Sirius? Does he think I'm funny? Yeah, obviously. Remus nodded, pleased that she was finally smiling again. We all do. Your impression of McGonagall is the best. This seemed to satisfy her, and by the time they'd reached the common room, Marlene looked positively cheerful. I'll help you catch up with crops if you want, Remus said as they climbed through the portrait hole. We can do it tomorrow at lunch. Thanks, Remus. Mary wrapped her arms round him again in a quick hug. She took her books and headed upstairs to her dorm room. Remus let out another sigh, sagging slightly with relief. Why did this always happen to him? Maybe he needed to start being meaner. Behind him, someone wolf-whistled loudly. He didn't need to turn around to see who it was. Here he comes! Look out, ladies! Gryffindor's number one heartthrob coming through! Sirius crowed as Remus went over to join his friends by the fire. James was immersed in a book, but looked up and winked at Remus. You're going to have to tell us your secret, Mooney, Sirius continued. You seem to get all the girls. She's just a friend and you know it. Where's Pete? Showering, James replied. Peeves attacked him with a jug of yesterday's custard. Ugh. Yep, that's the sound he made, James smirked, returning to his book. Thank Merlin you're back, Sirius addressed Remus. James has been so boring today. I'm revising, James said calmly, turning a page. You should be too. Pfft. I'm done revising for today, Remus grinned. Want a game of snap? 
Have I told you lately how much I love you? Shut up and deal the cards. Chapter 55 Third Year Greyback You're too old to lose it, too young to choose it, and the clock waits so patiently on your song. You walk past a cafe, but you don't eat when you've lived too long. Oh no, 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 you're a rock and roll suicide. Friday, 28th of June, 1974 Unsurprisingly, Sirius achieved obscenely high marks in everything except astronomy without lifting so much as a finger to study. By this point, Remus wasn't sure if Sirius genuinely did have some strange pure-blood gift or if he was just an unrecognised genius. Remus didn't mind either way. He himself came top in care of magical creatures, runes, and history of magic, second highest in arithmancy after Sirius. Nicely done, kid! Ferox slapped him on the back at breakfast the morning the results came out. My best student! Thanks, Professor, Remus grinned, feeling dizzy with pleasure. <laughs> We've got a few books you might like to borrow over the summer. Pop into my office before you leave, eh? Teacher's pet, Sirius teased as the tall, jovial man walked away, whistling a jaunty tune. Remus didn't respond. He was too pleased with himself. Can't believe it's till fourth year now, James said, cleaning his glasses on his robes. Do you have to keep reminding me? Sirius moaned, putting down his fork and knife. Plenty of time over the summer, James replied. It'll fly by. What are you doing over the summer? Remus asked suspiciously. Planning next year's pranks, obviously, Sirius said a little bit too quickly. Got to keep ahead of the curve, Remu, my boy. We've got a reputation to maintain. It was the last official day of term, so Remus decided to ignore the fact that this was clearly a lie. He had all summer to be paranoid that the other three were leaving him out. There was no need to worry yet. After breakfast, he wanted to go straight to see Professor Ferox, but thought that might come across a bit too eager. Plus, the other three would surely want to come with him, and Remus couldn't stand the thought of Ferox meeting Sirius and James. He would no doubt be charmed by their natural-born charisma and wonder why he ever thought Remus was special at all. The foursome went upstairs and packed. That is, James, Remus, and Peter packed. Sirius bounced round the room trying to distract them, sending books and clothes flying, flicking his record player on and off. It's getting done whether you like it or not, James chastised, hands on his hips and a very good imitation of his mother. You'll do it for me, like last year, Sirius replied, standing on his bed and attempting to do pull-ups hanging off the bed frame. The ancient wooden beams creaked. Remus closed his own trunk. His corner of the room looked very bare without the usual chaos of books, papers, quills, and clothes strewn about it. He went over to the record player to give one last fond caress of his favourite album covers. Summers were so quiet without Sirius's music. Matron only ever liked to have the radio on once a week, for the Radio 3 choral Evensong. Mooney, James said suddenly. Don't you have to go see Madame Pomfrey? Uh, but, yeah, but not right now. Remus looked up surprised. Well, I mean, if you finish packing, you may as well, right? When I've done Sirius's stuff, I was going to suggest we all go out on our brooms, and you hate flying, so... Oh, really? Okay, then. Remus nodded, feeling unaccountably hurt. It wasn't at all like James to chase you out of the room. We'll see you at dinner, right, Mooney? Sirius asked, swinging forward and landing on his feet with the agility of a gymnast. Yeah, I suppose... Remus left the room, feeling as if he was being escorted from a party to which he was not invited. Fair enough, he didn't like flying much, but that didn't usually matter. Often he'd sit in the stands and read his books while the others mucked about in the air. He wouldn't have minded doing that this time. He did have to see Madame Pomfrey anyway, so he went to the hospital wing, struggling to shake off the nasty feeling of exile. "'You're very quiet, dear,' the Medi-Witch commented as she completed his end-of-year checks. Not looking forward to your holidays? No, not really. You'll miss your friends, she clucked her tongue sympathetically. It's a shame, I know. Still, I expect you've got lots of muggle pals to play with. Remus didn't bother answering. Madame Pomfrey was very kind and hadn't a bad bone in her body, but she, like most adults, could be incredibly dense. He was privately hoping that the coming summer would be just as lucrative as the last. If Craig was still about, then perhaps he could make a bit of cash. 
He proved himself capable. He might even ask for more than just cigarettes. She gave him the same instructions as the year before. Eat well, exercise, and rest. I'll see you in early July, she smiled serenely as he was comforted with the thought that at least he wouldn't be completely isolated from the wizarding community. That being dealt with, Remus considered returning to the dormitory. Perhaps they were all finished talking about him, or whatever it was they needed him out of the way for. Perhaps they'd gone flying already. He didn't begrudge them. James was of the opinion that if Sirius was in a temper or too wound up, then a good hour's exercise was the best thing. And it usually was. Plus, it was one of the few times Peter didn't get left out. Despite his clumsiness on land, Pettigrew was a surprisingly good flyer. No doubt a result of James' relentless drilling. It was really the perfect time to go and see Professor Ferox, of course, but Remus dawdled. He suddenly felt quite shy, never having been to see a teacher alone before, unless he was in trouble, of course. Walking slowly, he eventually made a directional choice at a particular corridor and decided he may as well get over it. He knocked tentatively on Ferox's office door, even though it was slightly ajar. His heart hammered in his chest and he found himself half hoping that his teacher wasn't there after all. Remus couldn't help but recall with some embarrassment how only a few weeks ago he'd almost come running to Ferox in a moment of panic, only to recognise that it was a terrible idea at the very last minute. Come in! Ferox's cheery voice echoed from inside the room. Remus squared his shoulders and entered. Mr Lupin! Ferox boomed. He was not sitting at his desk. Remus didn't think he'd ever seen Ferox seated except at mealtimes. He was always moving. Just now he was packing a small trunk, Achilles the Neasel watching quietly from the windowsill. Even after a year of lessons with Ferox, Remus was still somewhat in awe of his teacher. His gigantic presence had not diminished, his mane of sandy curls was still as glorious, his face still heroic with decisively carved features. Hello, sir, Remus smiled as he entered, closing the door behind himself. You asked to see me? Indeed I did! Ferox smiled broadly, nodding to a pile of five books at his desk. Those are for you if you've room in your trunk. Next year's set text and a few other things I thought might interest you. Remus approached the desk and fingered the leather-bound tomes carefully. Thank you, Professor, he said quietly. He'd never received such an enormous gift before. Ferox nodded, sitting down finally, gesturing that Remus do the same. Butterbeer! He withdrew some bottles from the bottom drawer of his desk. Thank you, Professor, Remus repeated, accepting the bottle and sitting down. Achilles, on the window ledge, stretched, yawned, then curled up to sleep peacefully. Remus felt he ought to say something else. Dumbledore normally sends me my books and stuff, he offered. You don't have to. Well, I know you're a bit out of the loop during the holidays, so I thought you might appreciate a head start. Ferox continued to smile his big, easy smile. Remus felt a strange kind of warmth fizzing in his abdomen, which was odd because he hadn't so much as sipped his butterbeer yet. Kind of you, he said, looking down at the books again, uncomfortable with too much eye contact. I'm not being charitable, Remus, I, I promise, Ferox said reassuringly. I know what it's like, you see. I came to Hogwarts with almost as little as you did. Muggle-born, raised by my nan. Of course, she never understood anything I did here. Bless her heart. Remus blinked. This was interesting news. He'd assumed that most of the teachers at Hogwarts, in fact, most of the adults he respected, were all purebloods. It was an immense relief to learn that this wasn't the case. Us rough kids have to stick together, eh? Ferox winked at him. Yeah. Remus continued to nod emphatically. So, you never had a problem getting a job or stuff like that after school? Well, there are always going to be folks who can't see past your blood status, no matter who you are, Ferox said, a wry smirk on his face. But you learn pretty quick how to prove them wrong. Well, I don't need to tell you. No, Remus agreed. He took a swig of his butterbeer. So, are you an orphan too, Professor? I am. Coming as muck, too, you wouldn't believe the flack I got for this accent back then. Mary and Marlene think you sound like Paul McCartney, Remus said. Ferox laughed, a great joyful wheezing laugh. I'll have to remember that one next time I'm on the pool. Remus felt himself blushing, hearing Ferox talk like that. Just goes to show, Ferox said. You never know how other people are going to see you. So never assume, eh? 
Remus looked up at him curiously but gave a small nod of understanding. The professor's expression softened. Remus, Ferox said so gently that it was unnerving. I... there's something else I wanted to talk to you about. Remus winced. He thought he knew he was coming. He'd been waiting for it since Christmas. Perfectly fine if you don't want to talk about it, the teacher said. Is it about... my problem? In a manner of speaking, Ferox said in a measured tone. I don't know if you know this, but I knew your father Lyle quite well. Remus almost choked on his butterbeer. He hadn't quite expected that. Ferox continued. I work off and overlapped, you see. I was young, hadn't long started in care of magical creatures department. I knew him by reputation, of course, so I tried to learn what I could, though I never did Master Bogots quite like he did. Okay. Remus didn't know what else to say. Do you know much about him? I... Remus looked away out the window. He didn't think he could talk and look at Ferox at the same time. He was a Ravenclaw, he started, as if ticking off items on a list. He was good at dueling. He was good at bogots and dementors and poltergeists, and he hated werewolves. He wanted them all dead, and, and he... Remus choked, wanting to stand up and leave the room. Where did you hear that? Ferox looked shocked. Remus looked at him, though everything was swimming in tears now. It felt as though all the nasty, spiteful thoughts he'd been having since December had come pouring out like poison. Darius Barebones, he said, rubbing his eyes roughly on the sleeves of his robes, forcing himself under control. Met him at the Potter's Christmas party. That old pisshead, Ferox snapped gruffly. He looked annoyed, but not at Remus. I'm so sorry, Lupin. What a thing to hear. It's not true, you know. He didn't... hate them? Well... Ferox tilted his head as if trying to be diplomatic. He was concerned about the danger werewolves posed to society, but he was a sensible man, too sensible for hatred. You're a lot like him. Remus snorted bitterly at that. It's true, Ferox said firmly. He was a good man. He'd do anything for anyone. Darius said he thought Lyle was bitten by Greyback. That's why he killed himself. You know about Greyback, then? Remus nodded. Ferox looked very serious indeed. I've heard that rumour. Wouldn't be surprised if Dumbledore started it to protect you, to be honest. Personally, I never believed it. Then I met you, of course, and it all became clear. Is it that obvious? Remus asked, raising his fingers to the scar on his face, over a year old now, but still dark and red. No. Ferox shook his head. Most wizards wouldn't know a werewolf if it jumped up and bit them. Ferox laughed, lifting the dark mood that had settled over the bright office. Your father's sense of humour, too. Remus smiled weakly. Professor? Yes? What happened to Greyback? Ferox instantly turned serious again. I'm afraid we don't know for certain. He's still alive as far as the Ministry's concerned, and still wanted for his crimes. I don't know if they'll ever catch him, to be honest. The man's a maniac, by all accounts. Could he... find me? Maybe. Remus was startled by Ferox's honesty. He didn't seem as concerned as most adults about protecting him from the harsher truths. Does that frighten you? The teacher asked. Remus shrugged. I think... I think maybe I've always known that. That I'm going to meet him again. You mustn't go looking... I won't. Remus knew that was a lie, but he also knew there was nothing Ferox could do to stop him. If you have more questions, I want you to feel comfortable asking me, Ferox said. There are some old newspaper clippings inside that top book. He nodded at the pile he gifted Remus. I thought you ought to have them. There's... Things that oughtn't be kept from people, and you're old enough. Thank you, Professor. I haven't upset you? No, Professor. Good lad. Ferox stood up, leaned over the desk, and squeezed Remus's shoulder in a friendly sort of way. Try and have a good summer, eh? I'll see you in September. Remus nodded, feeling a bit dazed by the events of the past half an hour. Nevertheless, he was quite grateful to be dismissed and quietly left, carrying the heavy pile of books back upstairs to the common room. It was very quiet in the Gryffindor common room now. 
Most of the students had finished their packing and were no doubt outside, enjoying the grounds. Remus's thoughts turned to Davy Gudgeon, and he squashed that down. One emotional crisis at a time. The marauders were gone too, Sirius's things now neatly packed away in his serpent chest. The room was stuffy and hot. Remus flicked his wand to swing the windows open, then sat down on his bed and opened the first book. Sure enough, pressed like dead leaves between the inside cover and the front page, three yellowing newspaper clippings. Daily Prophet, April 1964 Werewolf attacks on the rise. Could your children be next? The Ministry of Magic has today confirmed that the recent spate of murders both in the muggle and wizarding community is the work of dark creatures, namely werewolves. Ministry officials are particularly concerned that in many cases the victims of the attacks have been children under the age of 10. One official, respected dark creatures expert Lyle Lupin, had spoken out and criticized the ministry for lax and willfully neglectful safety measures. Lupin claims that the ministry's current werewolf registry is poorly managed and maintained, enabling certain anti-ministry factions to use these loopholes to their advantage. The current number of victims is suspected to be 17, but set to rise as the investigation continues and the perpetrators continue to elude capture. A statement from the Aura's office is expected later today. Daily Prophet Obituaries, January 1965 Lyle Lupin, who has died at age 36, will be remembered as a world-renowned expert on non-human spiritus apparitions for his extensive work with bogots and poltergeists, dementor liaisons, and more recently, his efforts to reform the National Werewolf Registry. Lupin is survived by his wife, muggle Hope Lupin, who he married in Cardiff in 1959. The couple have a young son, Remus John Lupin, born in 1960. The family has requested privacy during their time of grief. The Daily Prophet, February 1965 Aura's on lookout for Greyback The Aura's office is appealing to the wizarding public for any information pertaining to the whereabouts of Fenrir Greyback, werewolf and suspected child murderer. Greyback is described as 6'3", very strong and unclean, with the appearance of a vagrant. Wizards and witches are warned not to approach him and to consider Greyback extremely dangerous, even in human form. Aura Alistair Moody today made a statement indicating that the Ministry believed Greyback to be travelling with a pack of werewolves, making him all the more dangerous. Greyback is known to have a preference for small children, but Moody declined to comment on speculation that the werewolves planned to raise an army. The Ministry also declined to respond to allegations that they had Greyback in their custody last spring and failed to recognise that threat. Since the death of Lyle Lupin, an outspoken advocate for harsher sanctions on werewolves, there have been numerous efforts to improve recognition and registration of dark creatures. The first time he read them, Remus didn't even use his reading aid. The second, third and fourth times he did. Over and over, as if there was something more in them, as if he could suck the truth out. He had no more answers than before, and a hot, angry ball of rage had begun growing inside his chest, burning brighter as he re-read and re-read. Hours passed, the room grew dark, and in the end, he never went down to the feast. Chapter 56 Summer, 1974 Summary Remus reaches tipping point Warnings. Mention of violence, petty crime, underage drinking, and some swearing. Mooney, hope everything's going okay with you this summer. Things are weird here. My family aren't interested in disciplining me anymore. They just keep attending all these meetings. Sometimes they're at ours, sometimes they go out. I think maybe they go to Bellatrix's place, or maybe, or the Malfoys. Regulus won't tell me what goes on. I think they've probably put a lips-locked spell on him or something, because normally he couldn't resist lording something like that over me. I feel like something bad is going to happen. I know that sounds stupid, but something's definitely not right in this house. Sometimes I'm glad you, James, and Peter are such a long way away. I'm going to try and ask to stay with James again. I know it's mental, but honestly, if they're just going to ignore me anyway, what's the point? I haven't even been asked to usher at Sissy's wedding. All the better, to be honest. So there's always the possibility they've disinherited me and just forgot to mention it. I can't wait till we're all seventeen, then we can just live together all the time, like at Hogwarts. I want to live on Carnaby Street, like in Melody Maker. You'll have to show me round. 
I know how the money works now, thanks to muggle studies. Best, Sirius O. Black. Sirius. Everything's okay here, don't worry about me. I don't really know what you mean by something bad. Do you think they're going to try to hurt you again? If you do, then definitely try and go to the Potters. Maybe they can tell Dumbledore or something. Sorry to disappoint you, but I've never been to Carnaby Street. St. Edmund's is in Essex, and we only go into London once a year, usually to the museums. You'd probably like the Science Museum, full of muggle inventions. Be careful, okay? Remus. Dear Mooney, Just so you know, Sirius is coming to stay with us this summer. He should be arriving this afternoon, so send his post here. Hope your summer is going well. You seemed a bit off at the end of term. I know you're going to say no, but Mum and Dad still say you're invited to stay whenever you like, and we could always come to you just to visit. Don't want you to be alone out there, mate, especially these days. James. James! What do you mean, these days? Is this what Sirius was on about, about his family meetings? You know what the Blacks are like. They just love secrets. It's probably nothing. They're probably planning Regulus's betrothal or something like that and want Sirius out of the way. Anyway, like I told Sirius, don't worry about me. Dumbledore and Madame Pomfrey reckon this is where I'm safest and they're the ones in charge of me, right? Obviously, I'd rather spend the summer at yours, but it's not happening, so can you please drop it? Don't come here either. Just trust me. Ah. Dear Remus, Sorry if I upset you, mate. I didn't mean to. I'll stop asking about it if you want me to. Hope you're having a good summer anyway. We all wish you were here. You're right. If Dumbledore says you're safe there, then you're safe there. Dad says Dumbledore might be the only one we can trust soon enough. Take care of yourself, James. Hi, Mooney. Four Marauders are definitely better than three. It's great having Sirius and all, but it's always like we have to keep doing whatever he wants. I'm mostly just lucky that Mum lets me see them at all after Phil left home. I got a postcard from her the other day. She's in America. Can you believe that? She said to say hello to you, so hello from Phil. Peter. Mooney, why'd you have to have a go at James? He thinks you didn't mean to come off like that, but I know what you're like, you moody git. What's up? Sirius O. Black. P.S. How come Philomena said hello to you and not to any of us? You're such a bloody ladies' man. <laughs> Remus. I know you got my last letter, the owl came back, and the potter's owls are even more reliable than my family's. Why aren't you replying? Sirius O. Black. Remus. Please let us know you're okay. James. Craig had been nicked at some point over the school year, and Remus returned to find that Craig's mate Stay was now in charge of the criminal element at St. Edmund's. He was a good deal uglier and stupider than Craig. Bit tall now for Robin, ain't ya? Stay squinted at Remus. Still skinny, Remus replied, holding his nerve. How you get all them scars? Fighting. Stay, laughed meanly. Yeah, right, weety little toff like you. Fuck off, Remus took a step closer. I ain't no toff. He was as tall as the sixteen-year-old, maybe even a few inches taller. Yes, he was weedy, but he was holding his ground and Stay was starting to look a lot less sure of himself. All right, the bigger boy said, tilting his head back away from Remus. Calm down, mate, you're in. Remus sneered at him, turned and walked away, satisfied. Not much had given him satisfaction so far that summer. He felt more isolated than ever before, and angrier than he had been in a long time. Remus had hated Ferox for giving him the information he had on the last day, so that he could not make sense of it or do anything about it. There was no one to tell. He was forbidden from mentioning Hogwarts to anyone at St. Edmund's, and he didn't even know where to begin with the other marauders. Their letters infuriated him, and he balled every one of them up in his fist when he threw them away. He couldn't bring himself to read or watch TV or even touch his homework. He felt as though he had boundless pent-up energy, like an animal stalking the length of its cage. It built inside him, heating up until he was blazing with desire to lash out and beat the shit out of the next person who crossed him. Fortunately, most of the St. Edmund's boys seemed to sense this. Though Remus barely spoke a word to anyone, the other kids avoided him like the plague. So he sought out Stee. Their first job was an easy one. He didn't even need to be small for it. They stole a car. And all he had to do was climb in with the rest of them. They drove round for most of the night, smoking and drinking from a bottle of vodka they'd pinched from the off-license some weeks prior. 
Remus decided that he liked smoking. It made him look tougher and kept his hands busy. He liked rolling cigarettes and he liked the way they burned inches from his lips. He liked breathing plumes of smoke and thought of Ferox chasing dragons in Romania. The other boys warmed to him after they got used to his quietness and his general odd manner. He was still the youngest in the group and they managed to treat him like a little brother, plying him with fags and booze. Remus got properly drunk for the first time that summer and they all laughed as he stumbled round in the park and sympathised when he puked his guts out the next morning. When they got drunk they liked to fight too, which suited Remus. In the dark up on the common they threw themselves round, belting out who songs or the jam or even football chants if they were feeling particularly mindless. None of them seemed to care if Remus was too young or too skinny, and none of them treated him like he was an invalid because of the scars. Sometimes you just needed to get bashed out a bit, and at the end of the night they all staggered home friends. The hot summer passed in a chaotic blur. Remus spent most of his nights out with Stee and his gang, and his nights sleeping off hangovers, trying to keep out of Matron's way. He didn't think about Hogwarts. He did very little thinking at all. Gotta get you some proper togs, Lupin, Stee slurred one night. Can't have you looking like a ponce all summer. Remus looked down at his standard-issue St. Edmund's jeans and grey shirt. There was sick on his plimsolls. Had he done that? He couldn't remember. I ain't got cash, have I? He responded, searching for the cigarette he'd tucked behind his ear only a few minutes ago. Or at least he thought he did. So? Aggie, a short and chubby boy who reminded Remus of Peter, shrugged. My mate works in a warehouse down South End. He'll get you some proper gear. And they did. For once, Remus looked like all the other boys his age. Not in second-hand clothes, but brand new. Bright blue drainpipe jeans, a button-down shirt, knock off Ben Sherman, but as good as the real thing, white braces and slack bother boots. They shaved his hair right down, even shorter than the matron did it. You look business, Stee caught him under his arm, rubbing his head with rough knuckles. When the moon came and Madame Pomfrey saw him, she pursed her lips. I'll say nothing about the outfit, she said primly, but I don't like the look of all these bruises. You must tell me if the other boys are hurting you. He just shook his head and waited for her to lock the door. He could already feel his blood boiling as the change began. The next day he was too weak to move. Madame Pomfrey insisted on staying the whole day to watch him, even arranging for a bed to be brought down to his little cell. Hangovers had nothing on transformations, Remus thought to himself. He'd have killed for a fag, though. Bored and too tired to be hungry, he finally reached for a book. The three slips of newspaper fell out again and he quickly slammed the cover shut before Madame Pomfrey could see. Greyback. That was why he was so angry, he realised, in the first moment of clarity he'd had all summer. In fact, Greyback was pretty much the reason behind everything that had gone wrong in Remus's life. Where could he be now? How could you hunt a werewolf? There were plenty of books on that in the Hogwarts library, but Remus had always avoided them before, frightened of what they might say. Well, tough. He'd have to stop being squeamish about stuff like that. He had to stop hiding from himself, stop letting everyone talk all over him, if he was going to... Yes. He was going to kill Greyback. To hunt him down and then put him down, just like his father had wanted. Lyle Lupin would not have died in vain. A bolt of adrenaline shot through Remus as he thought about it. It was much better than rage. It might take years before he was ready, he knew that and he'd need money. As soon as Remus was fit, he approached Stee once more. All right, Lupin, old pal. The older boy smirked with yellow tea through a blaze of sweet green-smelling smoke. Bloody hell, what happened to you? He frowned at Remus's fresh cuts. Never mind that, Remus growled, no longer stressing his old accent. Last summer, Craig did over so many off-licenses in pubs, I had a truck full of fag packets. This year, I've got bugger all. You're not as hard as Craig or something? Oi! Stee sat up, hooking his thumb behind his braces. Watch it! No, you watch it! Remus snarled, showing teeth. I've got two weeks left and I need to stock up. Are you in or not? Chapter 57 Fourth Year A Gathering Storm Sunday 1st of September, 1974. 
As Remus approached King's Cross Station for the fourth time in his early life, he felt utterly invincible. He had grown taller over the summer, and his face had changed too. It no longer childish and round, his jaw was set and his eyes mean. In his heavy black boots, polished to a shine that morning, and his smart new clothes, Remus felt a stronger sense of identity than he had ever had. Stee had been very keen to give him a tattoo before he returned to school, but Remus had balked at that. He had enough marks already. They all think you've joined a gang, Matron tuttered, barely concealing her disdain as she dropped him outside the station. You look like a delinquent. Piss off, he muttered. What do you care? She gave him a sharp clip round the ear and he winced. She had to reach up to do that these days, but she still knew exactly where it hurt most. You'll be at school before it gets dark, won't you? She said businesslike. He nodded sullenly. It was a full moon that night. Good, she said. See you next summer, then. He entered the station alone and walked through the crowds with a practiced masculine gait, legs apart, hands balled into fists. People moved quickly out of his way as he approached, and a station guard eyed him suspiciously. Remus ignored them all and strode forward purposefully, directly through the ticket barrier, bursting onto platform nine and three quarters without so much as flinching. He was late and the platform was already almost empty, with only the last few tearful parents of first years lingering to wave goodbye. A cursory glance told Remus that the other three marauders were already on the train, so he climbed aboard and headed straight for their usual compartment, pushing roughly past other students, many who seemed very small to him now, as he struggled with his battered old trunk. They were in there, all three sitting squashed up on the same side of the compartment, huddled behind the morning edition of the Daily Prophet. All right, Remus said as he entered. James, who sat in the middle holding the paper, lowered it, and three pairs of eyes stared at Remus. Peter looked white and nervous, which was pretty normal, and began chewing his bottom lip, glancing at James for an appropriate response. James smiled, trying to be friendly, but his brown eyes wandered over Remus from his steel-toed boots to his closely shaved head. Sirius was the hardest to read, his eyes widened slightly, but his expression remained neutral. Remus slung himself into the seat opposite as if he'd not noticed. Good summer? Not bad, James said cautiously. The usual, you know. How was yours? Yeah, good. Remus withdrew a small tin case from his back pocket and opened it up to reveal five pre-rolled cigarettes. He placed one between his lips and lit it with a match as the train began to pull away from the station. Peter was now staring at Remus with his mouth slightly open as if he didn't recognise him. James looked concerned, a small crease formed between his eyebrows. We were worried when we didn't hear from you. Sorry, busy, Remus shrugged, exhaling smoke. Doing what? Sirius asked bluntly. James got up to loosen the window and let the smoke out, but he didn't say anything about it. Just busy, Remus said. They kept secrets from him, after all. He didn't have to tell them anything. Are you okay, Remus? James finally asked. Has something happened? Nope. You seem different. Your clothes! Peter squeaked suddenly. I've seen muggles dressed up like that. Sirius finally spoke up. It's cool, right, right, Remus? Remus shrugged again, feeling pleased, but hoping he looked outwardly nonchalant. My mate's got him for me, that's all, he said. Oh, well, if it's a muggle thing, James said uncertainly. You sure you're okay? Lay off, Potter, Remus sighed, rolling his eyes. He didn't want to talk about it any more. Though he'd expected even wanted a reaction, he didn't like the way they were staring at him. Typical purebloods. They could prance round in hundred-year robes and stupid pointed hats and no one said a word, but jeans and dark martens were apparently a step too far. What are you reading, then? he asked, nodding at the paper, hoping to distract him. James looked gravely down at the broadsheet in his lap. The war, he said, handing Remus the prophet. War? That made him sit up straight. What war? He looked down at the headline, which read, Jenkins criticised as security measures on ministry tightened. Didn't you know? James looked incredulous. The Wizarding World has been officially at war since 1970. 
Sirius and Peter nodded solemnly. We weren't even at Hogwarts in 1970, Remus said defensively. I mean, I hardly knew anything about wizards. What? Who? Who are we fighting? That's the problem, James said brusquely. It's too difficult to know, but this Dark Lord person has been gathering a lot of allies, almost all purebloods. I reckon those are those meetings my family are going to, Sirius said, his voice low, even though they were alone. James's dad agrees with me. Is that why the Slytherins were such a pleasure to be around last year? Remus asked, connecting the dots now. Yep, Sirius said. And it'll be worse this year, you can bet. There were some attacks this summer, James said nervously, on muggles and a few mixed blood families. They think the Dark Lord is using dangerous creatures, Peter said, his voice trembling with fear. Vampires and... and giants and... and... Remus shot him a look and clenched his jaw. And werewolves? Mooney, James started. I need the loo. Remus stood up quickly, exiting the compartment. He stormed through the train, younger students leaping out of the way as he passed them, terrified. He didn't need the loo, obviously, but there wasn't exactly anywhere else to go, so he locked himself inside a cubicle at the far end of the carriage. It was much posher than the loos on muggle trains, with actual red velvet curtains in the windows and gleaming gold fixtures. The mirror even had a gilt frame. He stared at himself for a few moments, glaring into his own eyes, clenching the sides of the sink until his knuckles turned white. He thought he would be so tough after this summer. Thought that nothing could touch him now. But everything was already unravelling. Faster than he expected, and he'd lost it at the very first mention of werewolves. How would he ever do what needed to be done if he couldn't stay calm? Greyback would eat him for breakfast. Unable to look at himself any longer, Remus sat on the toilet seat and considered punching the soap dispenser. That probably wouldn't provide the satisfaction he needed, and he'd only ebbed up covered in floral-scented pink slime. He kicked the basin with his foot instead, leaving a long black rubber streak on the white porcelain. Fuck! he muttered. That felt good. Fuck! he shouted, kicking the basin again. Who's in there? A sharp rap came at the door. Bugger off, it's occupied! He shouted back fiercely. This is a Slytherin carriage, you know, the voice said coldly. Oh, fuck up, you stupid busybody, Remus replied, slamming the door with his elbow. If he'd been in a more reasonable state, he might have calmly explained that the carriages were not divided into houses, and actually anyone could sit wherever they wanted, even if it was on a closed toilet seat. I shall call for a prefect. Oh my god! Remus stood up, withdrawing his wand. Are you looking for a fight or something? He flung the door open, finding himself face to face with a very shocked-looking Severus Snape. Severus might have frightened him when they were both eleven, but at fourteen Remus towered over Snape now, and with his wand raised and his face screwed up in annoyance, he must have been a terrifying sight. You! they both hissed. Snape tossed his greasy black hair and sneered. What were you doing in there? None of your business. Out of my way. What are you wearing? Snape pulled a face, looking him up and down with disgust. Are those muggle clothes? So what if they are? Remus took a step forward, now so close to the Slytherin boy that he was practically breathing on him. Got something to say? Not so big without your creepy mates around, are you, snivellous? He gave him a hard shove, knocking Snape to the floor. Snape glared up at him, scrambling to his feet quickly and dusting off his shabby black robes. He narrowed his eyes. You'll find out all about my mates this year, loony lupin. I'll promise you that, he said very coldly. Not exactly in a position to be giving out threats, though, are you? Remus replied almost conversationally. I've heard that lot prefer pure bloods. And Lily's told me all about you, Snape. Snape's eyes flashed and a look of pure hatred crossed his face. He reached for his wand, but whether it was thanks to the closeness of the full moon or just pure adrenaline, Remus was too quick for him. He grabbed Severus's wrist and slammed it against the wall of the carriage, causing the Slytherin to cry out and drop his wand. Then, thinking of nothing but causing the most pain possible, 
Remus snapped his head forward and butted Severus, knocking him down a second time. Snape was staring up at him, his black eyes shining with fear and rage. He clutched his robes against his nose, which was now gushing blood. Remus, feeling no better about any of it, spat on the floor and stepped over Snape. That's your warning for the rest of the year, he growled. Stay out of my way. Snape said nothing, but didn't try to get up. Remus walked away, confident the other boy wouldn't try anything now. He stalked back the way he came, trying to get away from the rich, intoxicating smell of blood, and shut himself in the first empty compartment he came across. There he sat, breathing deeply for a few minutes, trying to bring his heartbeat back under control, and to ignore the craving that was echoing somewhere deep inside him, where human reason could not touch it. Eventually, with shaking hands, he pulled out another cigarette and smoked it brutally, staring out the window. He was not alone for long. Mooney? The door slid open and Sirius's head poked round the corner. Remus glared at him, but Sirius came in anyway and sat opposite. All right, what's up? Nothing. Remus crossed his arms and slid down in the seat, staring at his boots. The laces didn't match. Red on the left, yellow on the right. He thought that looked really cool back in July, but now it looked a bit silly. Something's up. You're not yourself. How would you know? Remus spat in reply. Maybe this is just who I am. I just know, Sirius replied, uncharacteristically calm. Apparently spending so much time at the Potters had done wonders for his patience. It's okay to be angry sometimes, Remus. It doesn't mean anything except that you're normal. Remus looked up at him, surprised. Sirius smiled understandingly, then smirked. And for what it's worth, I think you do look really bloody cool. Really? Yeah. Kind of dangerous. Remus snorted at the irony. Thanks. So, bad summer, was it? Remus shrugged. It was okay. I was... I did a lot of stuff. I don't want James to know about it. Okay, Sirius agreed, then cocked his head brightly. Can I try a cigarette? He pronounced the word as if it was new to him, with a slightly French accent which was oddly endearing. Remus felt a surge of affection for his friend which sent his heart pounding again. He fished a fag from his case and tossed it over with the matches. He watched Sirius carefully purse his lips round the white paper cylinder, strike a match and cup his hands close to his face. He didn't cough, which was bloody impressive in and of itself, but only took a shallow breath before exhaling and making a sour face. You get used to it, Remus smirked. Okay, Sirius tried again, inhaling more this time. It was weirdly hypnotic watching Sirius smoke. The haze of bluish-grey made the carriage feel more intimate and private. Remus began to relax for the first time in months, as if something inside him was unclenching slowly. He looked at Sirius and thought, Why not? I found out some things at the end of last term, he said quietly, looking at his boots again. He reached into his shirt pocket and withdrew the three newspaper clippings Farox had given him last summer. He handed them to Sirius, who reached through the smoke with long white fingers to receive them. I don't want to talk about it yet, Remus said quickly, but read them if you like. Okay. Sirius nodded gently. Thank you, Remus. Chapter 58 Fourth Year Competition Remus's bad start to the year did not improve when the train drew into the station. They arrived in Hogsmeade with only twenty minutes or so until sunset, and Remus found Madame Pomfrey waiting for him, looking anxious. Good luck, Mooney. Sirius said under his breath as they parted ways amidst the throng of excited black-robed students. Remus nodded grimly, and Sirius gave his shoulder a nudge with his own, a show of adolescent solidarity. Remus only had time to glance wistfully back as the three marauders climbed into one of the horseless carriages, one blonde head, two dark, before Madame Pomfrey seized Remus by the elbow and, without warning, apparated to the shrieking shack. There was a blue and white plate sitting on the dusty mantelpiece with a thick chicken sandwich on top. In case you're peckish, the nurse explained, you've still a bit of time. He was starving hungry but couldn't bring himself to eat it. 
Instead, he just sat down on his cot and waited to be locked in, wishing there was at least a bit of light in the dingy room. Remus thought about the feast, arguably his favourite part of the first night, other than sleeping in his big, comfortable bed. Neither would be happening tonight. He could smell a rabbit outside, snuffing the grass, and his stomach gave a fierce growl. He looked at the sandwich again and considered it, but as pain shot through his shoulder blades, he realised he'd waited too long. The wolf was on its way. Monday, 2nd of September, 1974 One might assume that a hungry werewolf would quite fancy a chicken sandwich, but apparently only raw meat would do, and Remus woke to find that the little meal remained intact, while his arms and legs were ripped to shreds. He sighed heavily, hauling himself to his feet and went to sit on the bunk again. His hip had gone funny for the third time, and his limp was exaggerated as he staggered across the room. His left shoulder felt dislocated. Thank God it wasn't his right, because he had a lot of homework to catch up on. Closing his eyes, Remus slouched back against the wall to wait for Madame Pomfrey. It was dawn, and the marauders probably wouldn't be up for a few more hours, unless James decided he need to squeeze some flying in before lessons. Remus knew that it was Harpeet Singh's final year at Hogwarts, which meant that the position of Quidditch captain would be open next year, and James was not messing about. Hercio's sandwich, Remus rasped, finding his wand under the bed. The entire plate came flying toward him at such a speed that it hit the wall and shattered only inches away from his head. Groaning, Remus brushed away the shards of porcelain and began to pick hungrily at the stale bread. Madame Pomfrey soon arrived and set to work patching him up before accompanying him back to the castle. He insisted on walking, rather than having her conjure a stretcher. "'I'm really not that bad,' he cajoled. "'You've done a great job on my shoulder. I reckon I'm fine to go to lessons.' "'I don't like the look of that limp,' she replied. "'Hospital wing first. We'll see how you are at lunchtime.' "'But it's my first day.' He knew he was whinging, but he had to try. I'm sorry, Remus. Anyway, look at you. You're dead on your feet. A few hours sleep and you'll feel much better. Much to Madame Pomfrey's dismay, James, Peter and Sirius were waiting outside the hospital doors for Remus, meaning that sleep would have to be put off a little bit longer. How'd James get you two up this early? Remus grinned at them. It wasn't easy, James grinned back, Sirius stifling a yawn behind him. I had to resort to threats of violence. And actual violence, Peter said, rubbing his arm, which looked very red. You okay, Mooney? Sirius asked, blinking a lot as if to look more alert. Fine, cheers, Remus nodded as Pomfrey ushered him into the room. The marauders waited patiently while Remus undressed behind a screen and climbed into his usual bed at the far end of the ward. Five minutes, Pomfrey snapped, carrying over a sleeping draught. He needs his rest, boys. "'We can't stay longer anyway,' James said. "'Lessons and everything. "'We brought you your new timetable, Mooney.' "'He handed over the sheet. "'Remus studied it carefully. "'Ferox's lessons were at the end of the week, "'so at least he wasn't missing those. "'But he had McGonagall and runes. "'And history today. "'Could you?' he started. "'We'll get your homework, Mooney, don't worry,' "'Sirius said, amused. "'Nice to see you back to normal.' "'Yeah.' Remus raised an eyebrow, stretched out a bare arm to display his fresh claw marks. Can't get much more normal than me. He did feel much better once he'd slept the morning away. The anger which had torn him up for the last few months was still very present, but in some small way it had shifted and he was able to think about other things. At Hogwarts he felt better equipped to control his temper. He felt grounded and somewhat saner. As much as he didn't like to admit it to himself, Remus was beginning to feel more at home in the wizarding world than the muggle one. In addition, he felt surprisingly positive about having given Sirius the newspaper clippings. They had been burning a hole in his pocket all summer, and he was glad to be rid of them, to let someone else in on the secret. Pomfrey allowed him to leave for dinner, and he tried to slip into the great hall without too much fuss. This plan was scuppered, however, as he was rugby-tackled by three very excitable girls. Remus! They all shrieked, capturing him in a tight hug. Hi! He gasped, trying not to wince as Marlene squeezed his freshly mended ribs. We didn't see you on the train, Mary said. 
we weren't in runes, Lily added. You have a good summer? Marlene asked, her voice slightly muffled under Mary's arm. Yeah, great, thanks. Remus straightened his clothes as they finally released him, standing back and grinning at him. I wasn't feeling well, but I'm okay now. How are your summers? Great! Mary pulled him toward the Gryffindor table where the marauders were watching on with a mix of amusement and envy. He shrugged at them helplessly as he was manhandled into the seat. Wait till you hear what me and Darren did. Not at dinner, Lily said, sounding exasperated. Remus doesn't want to hear about what you got up to with your boyfriend. Remus's eyes widened. He certainly did not want to hear, and he flashed a grateful look at Lily, who smiled back. The girls all looked a bit different. Remus was so tall now that he barely noticed other people growing, but Mary, Marlene and Lily definitely had. They looked less like the kids he remembered from first year and now reminded him of the girls that Stee and his gang whistled at when they were out in town. Mary particularly had developed noticeable curves at some point and Remus couldn't ignore the fact that half the boys on the Gryffindor table were staring at the way her white school shirt pulled across her chest. Oi, ladies! Sirius called from further up the table. Can we have Mooney back, please? No, Mary replied, sticking out a pink tongue. She turned back to Remus. I really like your hair, Avni said. She saw you on the train and you were dressed like a skinhead. You haven't actually joined a gang now, have you? Remus shrugged. Fortunately, the food appeared at that moment, providing a decent enough distraction. Unfortunately, girls were not like boys when it came to eating. While the marauders simply would have tucked in, heads down until they finished, Lily and Marlene picked at their food slowly, chatting about school and who was going out with who, and their new favourite actors. Marlene fancies a Slytherin, Mary said slyly. I do not, Marlene turned bright red. You do so? I saw you watching him in potions. Are we doing potions with Slytherin again then? Remus asked, his stomach sinking. Yep. Lily said brightly. I think it's better, don't you? Slughorn always gives much more detail when his own house is in the classroom. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Mary cocked an eyebrow. Lily has had a crush on a Slytherin for years. Severus is my friend, Lily replied witheringly. Your boy mad, you. I can't help if I'm more experienced than you lot. Mary raised her chin in a very dignified, mature sort of way. Marlene covered her ears dramatically. If you're going to start talking about Darren doing that thing again, I'm leaving. Fine, fine, Mary said. I'll shut up. She didn't, though. She and Marlene ended up in a very intense debate over who was more attractive, David Essex or Donny Osmond. Remus took the opportunity to whisper to Lily. You've seen Snip... Uh, Severus today, then? Yeah, why? Um, did he say anything about seeing me on the train? No, oh, Lily said, surprised. Why? What happened? Nothing, Remus said quickly. Just usual, you know, him being a prat. Hmm, Lily replied, looking down at her food and playing with her fork. She seemed uncharacteristically nervous. He can be a bit of a prat, I suppose. She looked up again at Remus and lowered her voice even further so that he had to lean closer to hear her at all over the din of the dining hall. It was just a theory lesson today, Potions, she whispered. We didn't have to partner up, so if you wanted to work together again this year? Oh, you don't want to do it with Snape? Lily looked very pink indeed and shook her head. No, I think... Well, you're a lot less bossy, and we study so much together anyway, I just thought... Yeah, sounds good to me. Remus shrugged, returning to his food. He really was starving hungry. That pleased him too. James and Sirius always paired up, so did Marlene and Mary. There was Peter, of course, but he had lots of friends in Slytherin and intended to make mistakes when he was anxious, which annoyed Remus, who is a perfectionist. Lily was a nice, sensible sort of girl with a sense of humour, and she could always explain things to him so that they sounded easy. Plus, it would drive James bonkers. The Snape incident still bothered him slightly. He'd half expected McGonagall to be waiting to pounce as soon as he'd been discharged from the hospital wing. Severus almost always went running to a teacher, if he could get away with it. 
Anne Remus had been absolutely 100% in the wrong this time. He knew that much. Snape hadn't so much laid a hand on him. Remus had just humiliated him because he felt like it. And Snape didn't like being humiliated. Remus didn't know much about the troubled Slytherin boy other than the bits and pieces Lily confided, but he did know that Severus Snape could hold a grudge like no one else. He would have his revenge, and if it wasn't by getting Remus into trouble with the teachers, then it was going to be something far more unpleasant. So what were the girls talking about? James asked once they were all in their dorm room for the evening. He was trying to sound casual, but Remus saw through it. Oh, nothing interesting, he replied, unpacking his trunk. Boys, mostly, and snogging. Snogging? Sirius sat up on his bed. Yeah, I know. Remus scrunched his face up to show his distaste for the topic. It's all they're interested in these days. Mary and her muggle boyfriend did something over the summer. What did they do? Sirius looked very interested now. Not disgusted at all, Remus realised. Uh, he faltered. I don't really know. Lily wouldn't let her talk about it while we were eating. Ah, James nodded proudly. Too clever for all that nonsense, Lily. How do you know it's nonsense? Sirius asked. It's not like you do any snogging. Oh, and you do? James frowned. Could if I wanted, Sirius said, lying down again, arms behind his head. Plenty of girls fancy me. If you wanted, James smirked. So, what, you've got girls lining up for a cheeky snog and you're just not interested? An almost imperceptible look of panic crossed Sirius's face, only for the most fleeting of moments before it returned to its usual impish cheek. Jealous, are you, Potter? Ugh, of you, James teased back. Bet Lily fancies me, Sirius said. Take that back, James roared, launching himself at his friend, wrestling him into a headlock. Peter sighed heavily and looked at Remus. They were like this all summer, he sighed to Remus. Everything's a competition. Some hours later, Remus was just drifting off to sleep when his ears pricked and he heard those familiar footsteps crossing the room. Shortly, his bed curtain twisted aside and Sirius whispered, Uni, you wake? Yeah. Sirius crawled inside. Remus sat up nervously. Sirius had only ever paid him a visit once before. Usually he went to James if he wanted to talk about... Well, Remus didn't know what they talked about, but he assumed black family drama. The only time Sirius had sought out Remus was early in their second year, just after the marauders had discovered he was a werewolf. Remus thought back to that night occasionally, and the memory was tucked away in a safe, calm part of his mind. He remembered lifting his shirt so that Sirius could inspect his scars, long dark hair brushing his skin. Muffly Otto, Sirius whispered, casting the silencing spell. What's up? Remus asked, rubbing his eyes as Sirius lit his wand. The articles, Sirius said, pulling the clippings from his pyjama pocket. I read them. Oh, Remus felt a trickle of shame run down his spine. Right. I know you said you didn't want to talk about it, Sirius said quickly, but I just... Well, I wanted you to know I've read them, I suppose. Okay, thanks, Remus nodded. And I understand why you're angry. Hmm? Anyone would be, Sirius said fervently, his eyes huge in the darkness, twin blue flames. It's... it's... it's just such a shitty hand to be dealt, Mooney. Remus didn't know what to say to that. He could hardly disagree. I won't tell James a peep, Sirius said. Not unless you want me to. No, please don't, Remus said. I'm not... I'm not ashamed. It's just... private, you know? Sirius nodded, pursing his lips. It's safe with me. Remus, still feeling a bit shaky, gave a weak smile. God, you're so dramatic. Sirius laughed too. James's mum says I wear my heart on my sleeve. He nudged Remus with his toe. We can't all be master secret keepers like you, Mooney. I thought I wasn't me without secrets. Yeah, but if you have to have them, 
I'd rather I knew. Remus snorted. Because you're so special, Black. Because if I don't know, I'll just figure it out anyway. Like you and your little cigarette-selling enterprise. Remus's mouth dropped open. You looked in my trunk, you wanker! How dare you! Sirius replied haughtily. I would never stoop so low. One of the six-year lads came round asking for you. See if you were still selling this year. Remus groaned, slapping his forehead. Was it Dirk Cresswell? Bloody moron. How much did you make? Enough. Please don't tell James. You know what he's like about stealing. You stole them? Bollocks. Remus groaned again at his own stupidity. I don't know how you do it, Mooney, Sirius said, awed. But you surprise me every time. Chapter 59 Fourth Year, September Remus never did find out exactly what it was Mary had done or had done to her over the summer holidays. Whatever it was, though, it had given her a certain amount of status amongst the other girls in her year group, which was hard to ignore. On Thursday, their first lesson of the new term with Professor Ferox, Remus arrived in the classroom to find a cluster of girls whispering near his desk. He elbowed his way through, grumpily, reclaiming his workspace nest to Mary. The girls tittered and resumed whispering. Mary, of course, was at the centre of the group, holding court, and by the looks of it, having a thoroughly marvellous time. Marlene was sitting by and watching with a look of envy and respect. And it didn't hurt? A Ravenclaw girl asked in a hushed tone. No, it's fine if you relax, Mary replied with a bravado that reminded Remus of James. And you think you're going to, you know, with Darren? Another girl asked, her voice practically trembling with excitement. Well, I... Mary started, but at that moment Professor Ferox emerged from his office, announcing his presence with a cheerful salutation. Welcome back, class! Seats, please! The girls all hurried into class, some looking very red-faced and others unable to stop giggling. Remus frowned, trying to ignore them, and sat facing the front straight back. Ferox gave him a friendly smile and nod, and Remus nodded back, smiling uncontrollably. Farox had clearly had a fantastic summer. His fair hair was a shade brighter, no doubt bleached by the sun. It was longer, and he now wore it twisted back in a long knotted tail. His face was even more weather-beaten, and his nose rather red and peeling slightly from sunburn. He rolled up his sleeves, as usual, revealing sun-browned arms and the odd bird mark. "'Good summer?' he asked the class, who all nodded and murmured in the affirmative. He grinned and clapped his hands together. Excellent. I hope you all had a nice rest and you're ready to begin work on quadruple X-rated creatures for this term. First, let's do a quick recap of last term's work, then see who's done their summer reading. Remus himself had only just finished the reading that morning. He hadn't even started on the extra texts Ferox had lent him. He sorely regretted wasting the whole summer being reckless now and had already had to plead with Professor McGonagall to let him have an extra week on his transfiguration notes. He suspected that she only relented after a conversation with Madame Pomfrey, which made him feel guiltier still, as he knew he was capable of beating most of the class even after his worst transformations. "'You're being too tough on yourself,' Sirius told him, as they were chased out of the common room the night before by prefects telling them to go to bed. "'It's the beginning of the year. If you're going to fuck up, you may as well fuck up now.' Remus had just glared at him. "'Easy for you to say. Some of us actually have to work for our grades.' Plus, it's OWLs next year. I can't drop my standards now. Oh, please don't mention OWLs, James said, coming between them quickly in a less than subtle attempt to prevent an argument. McGonagall and Flitwick have already put the fear into me. And why did we decide to do divination? I quite like divination, Peter said thoughtfully, dumping his pile of books. Prophecies and all that. It's exciting. It's nonsense. Sirius gave the smallest marauder a withering look. You only like it because you're good at astronomy. It's not like that, James said slyly, changing into his pyjamas. Notice that Pete's got a new partner this year? Oh, yes, Sirius smirked. The divine Desdemona Lewis of Ravenclaw. 
Remus glanced up at Peter in a surprise and watched him turn a shocking shade of scarlet from his blue pyjama collar to the roots of his yellow hair. Shut up, he mumbled, climbing into bed. She's just a friend. James, Sirius said in a very solemn voice. What on earth are we going to do if Petey Boy here gets a proper snog before the rest of us? Well, your reputation will be in tatters for one thing, James replied in the same serious manner. What do I have if not my reputation? Sirius grinned back, getting into bed himself. Remus huffed with disapproval and pulled hard on his bed curtains, returning to his book and hoping they all got the message. If they did, it didn't matter. Of course, if I got a snog before you, that wouldn't hurt, James said. I'm on the Quidditch team. You don't have my animal magnetism, Sirius replied. There was a loud thump and an oi, and Remus assumed that James's pillow had crossed the room and made contact with Sirius's head. I bet you, James started. Oh no, Peter groaned. Please don't. I bet you ten galleons that I can get a girl to snog me within a month. Ten? Peter gasped. Done, Sirius called back. Just you wait, Potter. Remus, who lost all ability to concentrate on his book, huffed loudly again and decided to sleep. Pathetic. It wasn't just the girls any more. Now even the marauders were obsessed with snogging. It probably would be Sirius who won the bet though James had a fair point about the Quidditch team. He felt very sorry for Peter, who had gone very quiet. Remus tried not to think about the fact that none of his friends had made any comment on his likeliness to get a snog. He must rank even lower than he thought. Remus was troubled by this all week, right up to his Care of Magical Creatures lesson, which he now found himself daydreaming through. As Ferox's lecture drew to a close, Remus realised he'd made no notes at all. He looked down, panic, and saw a neatly folded piece of parchment. Who put it there? He glanced round furtively, then opened it. Please tell Sirius I think he's gorgeous. Effie Scunthorpe. X. Heat flared up in his neck as Remus screwed the note up into a ball and shoved it in his pocket. That settled it. Everyone had lost their minds. As well as contending with the raging hormones, which now seemed to infect every one of Remus's social circles, there was another noticeable change in the atmosphere at Hogwarts. Even if James had not explained to him that the Wizarding World was at war, Remus thought he would have worked it out for himself this year. Slytherins, who had always considered themselves a cut above the other houses, and had therefore maintained a certain distance, had retreated even further into themselves now. They gathered in huddles in classrooms, kept to their common room, and moved through the corridors in ominous groups. Muggle-born students were also travelling in packs, Remus had noted, and the teachers seemed to be making their presence known more than they had in previous years. This did not stop certain incidents from taking place, however. Anyone who was not a pureblood quickly became adept at defensive spells, and even the marauders had swapped pranks for protection. Where are the bloody prefects when you need them? James complained, having just fired off a few well-placed Engorgio charms at a few of the sixth-grade Slytherins who were tormenting a first-year Hufflepuff. The green-robed teens were now running away, clutching their various rapidly swelling extremities. "'I think even the prefects are scared,' Sirius replied, leaning against the wall, looking bored as James helped the Hufflepuff to his feet. "'Cowards!' "'All they can do is hand out detentions and take house points,' Remus added." And I don't think the Slytherins even care about those any more. I heard Mulciber last week saying they should all put up with trivial punishments for the promise of a greater reward. Mulciber said that? Sirius arched an eyebrow. Bloody hell, he's more eloquent than I gave him credit for. Yeah, or he's parroting back something someone else has told him, James countered, watching the Hufflepuff scurry away toward the kitchens. What do you think the reward is? Pete asked, scuffing his toe on the flagstones. Money, power, life eternal, Sirius sighed, rolling away from the wall and swaggering up the corridor. Godric knows. They won't get it, though. Why not? Because, Petey boy, we're gonna win. By the end of September, Snape had still not made his move. This put Remus somewhat on edge, and he wondered whether that was the intention. 
Their only shared lessons this year were potions and arithmancy. Arithmancy was fortunately a relatively quiet class, which mainly involved taking down notes and figuring out equations. Potions, being more practical, gave Snape, and the Slytherins as a whole, scope for much greater interference. As they agreed on the first of term, Lily and Remus became partners, sharing a cauldron and dividing up notes and directions. This clearly infuriated Snape, who barely took his eyes off them the whole time. However, Remus had to admit that this appeared to have less to do with him than it did with Lily herself. "'Have you fallen out or something?' Remus asked one afternoon as Severus shoved his way past to leave the dungeons. Lily sighed wearily. "'No, not exactly,' she said. "'He got annoyed when I had Mary and Marlene to visit over the summer, that's all. "'Thinks they're not the right sort. "'I have to keep reminding him that I'm muggle-born too.' "'Why do you put up with it?' "'I don't, really,' she replied, sounding sad. "'I always have a go at him when he spouts that pure-blood nonsense, "'and sometimes I think he listens to be. "'Well... But it's not easy for him. James was not making things easier. Anyone could see that. He and Sirius had conveniently set up their cauldron next to Remus and Lily's, and ever since they'd made their bet, James's pursuance of Lily had dialed up a notch. Now James Potter was a true star on the Quidditch pitch. That much could not be denied. He was elegant and graceful. He thought tactically and moved with simple subtlety. When it came to Lily... He was none of these things. Give us a snog, Evans, he tried during their first lesson. <laughs> Lily was so appalled she swished her wand fiercely through the air, upturning the contents of Potter's cauldron. He and Sirius were stained bright blue for an entire week. The following week, undaunted, James tried again. This time he had consulted his father, who had suggested that he try complimenting the object of his affections. I really like your hair he said confidently as soon as she approached the workbench. Hmm, she responded, not looking up. Yeah, it's so, um, ginger. Remus saw Lily's jaw tighten. She hated being called ginger. She told him once that she'd been teased for her hair in primary school. Remus took a step back, seeing Lily reach for her wand as she turned toward James with a false smile. Like it that much, do you? she asked. Sirius, who'd been watching Remus, took a step back as well. Poor James was too excited to finally have her attention and nodded vigorously. Oh yeah, I think it's... Refusio! Lily whispered, pointing her wand at him. Sirius guffawed so loudly that half the class turned to look and Remus had to cover his mouth to hide his own laughter. James's confusion made it even funnier, until Marlene handed over her compact mirror so that he could see his newly bright red hair. It took 48 hours to wear off, but it was no good. Even after two full days of being called Ginger Nut and Carrot Top, among some slightly ruder nicknames, wherever he went, James remained completely unshaken in his adoration. "'Just got to be patient,' he said dreamily, running a hand through his messy auburn locks. Nothing worth having isn't worth waiting for. It's kind of impressive, Sirius whispered loudly to the others. I sort of don't want to win the bet. He's made it too easy. Yeah, James snorted. That's why. Oh, suck it, Cobber Knob. Chapter 60 Fourth Year October when Lily's kisses were not forthcoming, James demanded that they extend the bet to last the whole year. Sirius, in turn, said that in that case it ought to be worth double the galleons, which turned Peter white. Remus once again registered his disapproval of the whole thing, and demanded they count him out. He had much better things to spend his time on, and would not be spending any more money than he needed to. The others would have to be happy with a chocolate frog each for Christmas, because he simply couldn't spare the cash. Remus knew that he would need every last nut the moment he turned seventeen in order to begin his mission to find Greyback. His investigation so far had been fruitless. He'd gathered up as many old editions of the Daily Prophet as possible from the library and lying about the common room. Some of the more recent editions had articles which mentioned werewolf packs, but there was hardly any detail and no names mentioned. 
In the end, Remus was forced to conclude that nobody really knew anything solid. He imagined werewolves were hard to find, especially if they were ordinary wizards most of the time. Asking Farrock seemed like the most sensible course of action. The Care of Magical Creatures teacher had suggested that he knew more than he had initially revealed to Remus last term, only Remus hadn't had the presence of mind to ask, still reeling from the news that Farox had worked for Lyle. He needed to work up the nerve before going back, however, and plan his questions carefully enough so that Farox wouldn't suspect anything. October began and ended with a full moon that year, which seemed very unfair, especially as it meant Remus would miss the Halloween feast. Still, the weather was unseasonably warm, and the marauders spent most of their free time enjoying the grounds under a fair blue sky, surrounded by the golden reds and browns of the most beautiful autumn Remus could remember. On weekends, he would settle down in the Quidditch stands with several books, parchment and a quill, and complete his homework in advanced reading, occasionally glancing up to watch one of James's drills, or cheer on poor Peter, who got stuck as the stand-in keeper. Sometimes Marlene practiced with them, which made the afternoons even more pleasant, as Lily and Mary would inevitably pop by. Sirius was unable to sit still at all during these sessions. He alternated between trying to focus on his homework, to hopping onto his broom for a race with James, to scribbling down complex tactical plays he thought the Gryffindor team ought to use in their first game, scheduled for November. We're going to trash the Slytherins this year, he kept muttering. Got to show em. Slytherin had won the Quidditch Cup the year before, and it was an immensely sore point with the Gryffindors, particularly Sirius, as both Narcissa and Regulus had been on the winning team. This year it was only Regulus who had replaced his older cousin as Seeker. Remus only knew this from James. Sirius had mentioned nothing. "'You need to lean into your broom more when you take a swing,' Sirius was telling Marlene, who just sat down for a rest. She was red in the face— fair hair plastered against her damp temples and not in the mood for Sirius's commentary. "'I hit the nine bludgers out of ten, she replied, panting. Ten times in my best games. Even Muxibur can't manage that. "'Don't try to be better than the competition,' Sirius admonished piously. "'You've only got yourself to beat.' "'Look, Black, if you think you can do better, we're having tryouts for beaters on Tuesday.' "'Nah,' he waved a hand, looking away. You beat me fair and square. Two years ago. He didn't respond and Marlene just shrugged, then staggered to her feet and headed back toward the pitch where James was calling for her. Remus had been reading his book throughout this exchange and hadn't wanted to interfere. He shot a glance at Sirius, who was leaning forward on the barrier, his chin resting on his arms as he watched the practice. Peter made a decent save and Sirius's eyes lit up. Remus bit his lip and thought hard before saying quietly, there are two beaters on a Quidditch team, you know. Bloody hell, Mooney, Sirius replied sarcastically, not taking his eyes off the pitch. Four years and you've finally learnt something about the game. Remus ignored that, only tutting under his breath. You know your problem? Do tell. You're proud, Sirius laughed. And you're not? Maybe. But I'd make a shit beater, wouldn't I? Sirius went quiet again. Remus sighed, heavily, closing his book, packing it into his bag. Look, you're gonna hate yourself later if you don't have another crack at it. Just going to sit here cheering James on for three more years. He stood up. I'm freezing. Off to the library. See you at dinner. Yeah, see you, Mooney. That Tuesday, Remus went along to watch the Gryffindor team trials and said nothing when he saw Sirius arrive, broom in hand. He didn't even smile smugly, though he dearly wanted to. Two hours later, Gryffindor had their new beater, and Remus realised that he now had to share his dorm with two Jameses. Except for one very important difference. While Sirius was undoubtedly full of passion for the sport, he appeared to lack James's discipline, particularly in the mornings. Wakey, wakey, James chanted brightly as he exited the bathroom, hair shining and wet, the only time it ever lay flat on his head. He pushed on his glasses and flicked his wand at Sirius's bed, drawing the curtains. It was a week after trials and this scene was becoming commonplace. Remus was already awake, almost dressed for breakfast, planning to get an hour's reading before lessons started. He was tying up his shoelaces as he watched James and Sirius begin their new morning routine. Sirius, who was little more than a shapeless lump under the duvet, 
groaned like a disgruntled troll. Piss off, Potter, he hissed, burying his head under the pillow. You wanted to be on the team, serious old chum. Come on, up you get. Levy corpus. With that, Sirius's body flew into the air, seemingly yanked by some invisible force, leaving him hanging upside down in mid-air while James laughed hysterically. I can't believe that worked. Been trying to do that since Christmas. Let me down, you wanker. Be nice. Let me down. Finite. Sirius landed on the floor with a thud and leapt up immediately, rubbing the arm he'd landed on. Bloody hell, he grinned at James. That was amazing. Now let me do it to you. Okay. Bodily levitation did not become a regular fixture of the fourth year boy's dorm, but trying to drag Sirius out of bed did. Just one day off a week, Potter, I'm begging you, he groaned at the breakfast table early one Sunday morning. He barely opened his eyes, his lolling head propped up on his elbow. You're the one who wants to destroy Slytherin, James replied cheerily, buttering some toast and sliding it over to his friend. Sirius glanced down at the offering disdainfully and looked away, closing his eyes again. James sighed. Not just you, either. The whole school wants to see them beaten. Think of it as doing your bit for the war effort. I thought you were doing your bit by hexing them in the corridors. Remus said, helping himself to a slice of Sirius's toast. Exactly, Sirius grunted, eyes still closed. And that can be done at a reasonable hour. This is the only time we can fit practices in, James said, starting to sound a bit annoyed now. There's no point going after dark. The pitch gets booked up in the evenings and lessons start at nine. Even if they started at twelve, you'd have trouble getting Sirius up, Peter said, mouthful of porridge. We should get time, Turners, Sirius yawned without a trace of humour. Students who need their beauty sleep should be issued with them. What's a time, Turner? Freemus asked, taking Sirius a second slice of toast. Turns back time, obviously, Sirius said scathingly. They're illegal, James said quickly, without ministry permission, and really, really dangerous. I'm really, really dangerous if I don't get enough sleep. Sirius grumbled. Matron used to make us all get up at six on weekends, Remus said thoughtfully, swallowing the last bit of toast. She thought it was healthy or something. One of the older boys got into her room once and fiddled with her alarm clock, though, and we got away with an extra two hours in bed every day for a week before she noticed. Muggles are ingenious, James chuckled. But stay away from my alarm clock. Hmm, Remus murmured, deep in thought. He could feel the beginnings of an idea coming on. Oh no, no, we've lost him, Sirius said, watching Remus. Probably daydreaming about nogtails and nifflers again. I swear, care of magical creatures is the only subject he cares about any more. Leave Mooney alone and eat your breakfast, James castigated. I want you on the pitch in five minutes. Fine, Sirius sighed heavily and looked down at his plate. Oi! Where's my breakfast? Gotta go, Remus said, suddenly standing up. Library, see you in potions. Early mornings were Remus's favourite times in the library. Everything was so neat and tidy, and he usually had the place to himself. Very few students were in the mood to study first thing, but Remus had found that during certain phases of the moon, he barely slept five hours a night anyway, so he was a regular visitor. The idea took a while to form properly, but he wanted it to be clear and complete before bringing it before the other marauders. Then at least it would be fully his prank. Remus felt the need to make his mark on something this year. Everyone else seemed focused on other things. The war, Quidditch, or the great snogging race, as Sirius had so eloquently dubbed it. They hadn't even tried to sneak to Honeydukes once. Remus felt very strongly that the marauders needed a prank. And a big one. He wasted half an hour researching complex and convoluted time spells, incantations to stop time, speed it up, slow it down, or even bend it. He wasn't really sure how bending timed worked, but it didn't sound pleasant or within his scope of ability. Eventually, he came to the conclusion that he was overthinking it, as usual. This was not a magical problem. It was mechanical. By the time the school day was about to begin, Remus had located the passage he needed in Hogwarts' history and was satisfied that he'd have a plan by the end of the week. He left for potions in a pretty good mood, 
one which was quickly shattered when he realised he was being followed. The feeling of being watched had been pricking the back of his neck while he'd been in the library, but as it was generally a quiet and solitary place anyway, he'd put it down to an overactive imagination, and there were always the chance that Madame Pince was lurking behind him, standing guard over a precious books. By 8.45, the hallways were crowded with students hurrying to their lessons, chattering and giggling, hurriedly eating breakfast on the go, or scribbling down last-minute homework. Although this year Remus's policy had been never to travel alone, he was satisfied that it was busy enough that there were enough Gryffindors around to be safe. However, as he began to descend their first set of stairs leading to the dungeon, the prickling feeling returned once more. As a rule, Remus tried to ignore instincts like that, they belonged to the wolf, and he resented the intrusion. But he couldn't shake it and reached for his wand, gripping it tight. Finally, only a corridor away from the potions classroom, he made a deliberate wrong turn and darted behind a tapestry. Sure enough, only a few seconds later, Severus Snape peered around the corner, looking confused. Irritation boiled up in Remus's throat, and before he could think about it reasonably, he pointed his wand at the Slytherin and chanted, Petrificus Totalis! Snape went rigid, a look of surprise on his face that would have been comical if Remus wasn't so angry. The black-haired boy fell to the ground, arms and legs straight as a board, completely paralysed. His beady black eyes stared around frantically as Remus stepped out from his hiding place. He gave him a kick, not too hard, and only in the shin, and smirked down at Severus. Stop following me, you creep, he said. Didn't I warn you? Snape stared helplessly up at him, and Remus laughed before heading to potions with a spring in his step. <laughs>